Okay. Uh, uh, let me start uh, by now because we are uh, running <laughs> time. So, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, good evening from my part. Good afternoon from Middle East and uh, uh, good, good morning to the Western part of the world. Uh, I think uh, now around 30 to 40 people are there. So it's time to start. Uh, the main, I would uh, start with uh, again, uh, kindly reiteration of uh, objective of this meeting. And then uh, I'll invite uh, the speakers. Uh, the, the main objective of this, uh, because uh, yesterday and today, there are a uh, few more audiences. So different audiences are there. So I'd like to reiterate uh, the objective the main objective of this meeting is to bring the scientists, researchers, uh, disaster managers, media people, and uh, the design engineers, uh, most of the people working in the field of safety and awareness uh, together to, to raise the awareness. I think it's an initiation of raising uh, awareness among the society that has been much affected by lightning. So this is the major um, uh, our basic uh, objective of today's uh, two days meeting. And also to, to make some strategies uh, to plan for the uh, forthcoming. I mean, the day after tomorrow, we are going to mark uh, International Lightning Safety Day. So how to mark this day, that is also one of the uh, main objective to meet before um, uh, this uh, day. So these two objectives were the major ob objectives and also to discuss on the future plan about the centers that we have been establishing in different parts of the world. These three objectives are the main objectives of the meeting. And uh, uh, um, I, I think uh, I should start uh, inviting the, the speakers who will highlight on the uh, objectives further. Uh, in this connection, I would like to invite uh, first Professor Chandima Gomez, uh, all the way from South Africa. Uh, he is, the, I, I think most of us know, know him. He is the high voltage engineer, uh, electrical engineer, and uh, lightning uh, scientist and researcher. I don't know what many things I should uh, address him with. So I would like to invite uh, Professor Gomez to highlight on the objectives as well as the plans of the centers that we have established and uh, further to establish in the uh, globe. Uh, Professor Chandima, would you like to share your ideas and uh, uh, you can uh, uh, share your screen as well. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sri. Uh, let me first uh, share the screen. Okay. Marianne, recording is uh, going on? Oh, okay. Okay, let me see Zoom. Yeah, it's been recording since the beginning. I didn't want to miss you this time. <laughs> Great. Uh, give me a minute. I'm trying to share the. Okay. Yeah. Yes, we can see it now. Yeah. Um, uh, good day to everybody. And uh, as I told you in my uh, uh, presentation yesterday, uh, today I'm, I'm going to continue from where I stopped in the previous uh, presentation. And a uh, few points uh, before going into the presentation. Whatever I present today and yesterday, uh, purely from my experience, actually uh, 
most of them, a majority of the information are first hand information through my experience working in several uh, parts of the world. Uh, Chandima, I think your internet connection and, uh, is uh, very few are hypothetical. Other than that, everything is from my experience, seeing uh, how uh, um, uh, lightning sent Chandima. You may have to sign back on. Yeah, I think he was thrown out. Yeah, mm. his internet is uh, pretty awful. I think he's using wireless. He should maybe hook up to the, to the landline. Yeah. Internet, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yes. that's better. Yes, much better. Okay, let let me switch off my uh, camera. I think then it will be better. Something went wrong. Can you hear me? No, your your voice is so stammering. Uh, uh, what we can do is I can invite Professor R K Bandari, and uh, let's switch back and forth. How do you, what do you think? Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, but is, your voice is not so clear. He seems to be gone again. Uh, yeah. uh, can you hear me? Oh, yes. Uh, what we can see is that if Again, again, there is a problem. Continues. You can go to the next speaker, and I will come later. Checking okay. what's wrong. Okay. Okay. Go to the next speaker. I will come back later. Wrong. Okay. Uh, now I would like to invite Professor R. K. Bandari, uh, who, who is uh, uh, acknowledged uh, uh, disaster mitigation management manager, with a pioneering contribution in the area of landslide disaster mitigation, for which he is the only Indian to have received Varnes Medal. Uh, the highest international award for excellence in research on landslides uh, at UNESCO uh, headquarters in 2012. Bandari has received many awards, which include Lifetime Achievement Award in, of the Indian National Academy, 
of engineering 2018 life lifetime achievement award of the indian academy uh, sorry building congress 2017 lifetime achievement award of the quantum global um, campus uttarakhand and so 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 dr bhandari is a distinguished alumnus of indian institute of technology mumbai and holds dic and phd in engineering from imperial college of uh, science and technology uh, may i invite uh, professor bhandari to speak and uh, share his uh, ideas yeah uh, good to uh, be here uh, in the company of so many distinguished uh, speakers could you straight away please share the screen i i sent you the presentation okay i have to uh-huh. <laughs> yeah uh, is there any problem uh, professor bandari you can share it as well if you have it up just push the green button no uh, i i suspect that uh, you know i recorded because internet might create a problem which is why i sent it but i don't mind going through the slides in case uh, you are not able to put that on yeah, you, you, yeah i'll i'll fix it uh, before that you start your presentation please okay yeah uh ladies and gentlemen uh, my greetings from india i'll uh, like to take you to a fascinating journey with lightning and i'll begin with the uh, times of richman you know uh, is a, a beginning of 18th century uh, rather first half of 18th century and to our collective dream of achieving multi hazard risk resilience so i'll be um, talking to you about this why did i choose uh, to um, talk uh, from the uh, beginning of 18th century is because that was the kind of a starting time where our concepts about lightning dramatically changed we started knowing fundamentally what lightning meant to uh, the world and uh, george william richman uh, who was a baltic german physicist uh, working in russia at the time uh, at the age of 42 he sacrificed his life uh, and uh, lightning punished him for revealing the secret that uh, thunder clouds contain electrical charge so that was the kind of fascination and interest of scientists in terms of lightning uh, we know that uh, uh, the the secret of lightning that uh, uh, he revealed in fact uh, uh, about the same time we have the uh, humongous contribution by uh, 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 many other scientists particularly benjamin franklin but franklin lived lived for 84 years and uh, uh, richman just half the age with a troubled childhood and very difficult times he showed the kind of passion and which has always motivated uh, young people in terms of further research on this and guess if you would not have uh, revealed to us the secret of lightning at that time how many more lives we would have lost now when he was conducting the experiment it is at that time that a ball of lightning hit him uh, right on the forehead and uh, this uh, traveled along his apparatus uh, the the um, fire flew out of it struck him and then it was actually the end of richman but beginning of the science of lightning benjamin franklin demonstrated that rain clouds are electrically charged but richman connected with the thunder clouds and also that it leads to lightning now with this kind of beginning now we have said this long journey that what have we learned in this long journey and i i find that this Uh, are you controlling the slide from that end uh, because they are moving too fast hello no, i think no 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 is from there i don't know uh, what is taking up this way anyway uh, so uh, maybe uh, uh, kindly ignore this if uh, my speech doesn't match with the slides because what i find is that moving too quickly uh, what i wanted to say uh, was that in this journey Uh, of uh, uh, so many years we have learned a lot and uh, 
there are some simple rules that people have. Now, you see, these are the deaths which have been occurring due to lightning. They are all avoidable death. So one of the best thing that has happened to spread public awareness is that uh, some simple rules, if they are followed, we can save the lives. Now, uh, light, lightning is a thr thriller in the sky and the killer on the earth. Why I say thriller is that it remains a thriller for scientists even today. And, and I think there's a lot more to come uh, in the years ahead. So we have to see that how this uh, killing instinct um, can be taken and can we harness this lighting uh, for uh, public good. Now, uh, uh, where there is uh, no lightning, there are there's no thunderstorm. And uh, this research, which is now going on, in fact, is not reaching public. Uh, I think most of us are busy in uh, um, uh, making use of the earlier loan knowledge. My suggestion would be that we should bring on board some of the scientists who are actively pursuing uh, this research and then they are connecting this knowledge for public uh, consumption. You know, for example, um, I myself, I, when I was at the VIT University, there was a thunder and lightning, and I found that uh, people, educated people were not aware. And I had to uh, really tell them that, look, uh, if the light travels at the, uh, I mean, sound travels at 0.2 miles per uh, second, and uh, you are hearing the thunder's uh, sound, Hardly two miles away, what is going to happen to your safety? So I think this small concept of safety, if we just state to the people, they will not understand it. But if we link it with scientific argumentation, then I think in the schools and colleges, we'll be able to spread that awareness of all that. Now, uh, uh, all these measurements which have been made, that most uh, lightning flashes are seen between four and six kilometers and things like that. I think there are case histories which are produced and I would like that in our uh, education, we should bring them in. The, the lightning can occur between the clouds, uh, uh, from cloud to earth, uh, that is ground and within the cloud. And all this is, makes it uh, very interesting for those who are looking at the total safety because these situations are different. Light, lightning strikes uh, all over the world and different parts. Thunderstorms also uh, occur everywhere li like that. And therefore, a, a, a webinar like this, where all of us from different parts of the world speak, I think that's the ideal way to, to learn more from them. Now, a lightning bolt travels very fast and delivers so much of electricity uh, can you ever imagine any human endeavor which can match this kind of magic uh, done by nature that you have 300,000 volts of electricity um, within a few milliseconds? It generates the heat if a temperature rises to the level of 30,000 degrees Celsius, which is five times the temperature at the surface of the sun. Now, uh, we have to not limit our this thing uh, to the thunder clouds and all that. We have to talk about snowstorms dust storms, volcanic clouds, where also this can occur. And also there's a, um, um, uh, there has to be understanding that areas of very heavy rainfall and all that, what uh, we are looking for in terms of safety. Now, there are also misconceptions, myths and beliefs. That, uh, many times I heard people say that lightning never strikes a place twice until I came across a news that Empire State Building once was hit by lightning 15 times in 15 minutes. And uh, now as a civil engineer, uh, I have been uh, contributing and been associated with lightning that harms the buildings by direct hit through wires, pipes, through ground reinforcement and so on. Very much is already known about it. Therefore, let me not spend time on that. Uh, I am also very concerned about the uh, kind of um, uh, things where a cardiac surgeon, you know, he has to be aware also that what kind of uh, problems are created um, in this and then uh, sleeplessness um, loss, uh, and loss of um, uh, this uh, trauma and all that. This is uh, very, very important. So in India, we have uh, been looking at this problem 
um, very casually before 2001. But in October 2001, the High Power Committee was constituted by Government of India and it came out with a report in October 2001. Uh, I was a member of that and uh, there we flagged lightning very specially um, um, as one of the major water-induced disaster. And then subsequently this was followed up by National Disaster Management Authority. You know that India has uh, authority uh, which is now created in, in the year 2005. And they came out with a report on lightning in 2018, where uh, it was uh, reflected nearly 2,000 to 3,000 lives are lost every year because of lightning in different parts, lightning and water related problems in the different parts of the country. Uh, and they covered squall, dust storm, hail storms, past experiences, everything that you need to know about lightning this document I would recommend. You please look at the uh, NDMA document of 2018. Now, uh, what really matters to us and which is why uh, I actually was uh, looking for this opportunity is that we have uh, no doubt to save lives against lightning. But you know that uh, India has uh, just uh, gone through, uh, is going through the pandemic, COVID. Simultaneously, we had two uh, major um, cyclones. You know that we still uh, have the problem of desert locust uh, affecting different parts of the country. A few days back, I gave a webinar on the effect of uh, micro tamers that which are taking place. Uh, and uh, uh, there is an imminent threat of an earthquake coming in. Now then we have also the warning which is created uh, now uh, lightning deaths then we'll have the floods and so on and so forth so we are living really in a situation where there's a multi-hazard uh, uh, problem and we have the problem of for example forest fires uh, that will be there and then um, uh, medical problems and so on and so forth so it is a time that we look at what our commitments are and in terms of the overall safety of the uh, people. You know, uh, what I would like to suggest is that uh, we have to look into multi-hazard uh, concept because it is here that our future lies. You know, absolute safety can come only when look at all the hazards and cascading of hazards. This was our commitment to the uh, Yugo framework 2005 to 2015, the same commitment we carried on um, later to Sendai framework 2015 to 2030. Uh, it is that context that I would like to suggest that earlier we think in terms of integrating this with the uh, other hazards, uh, the better, because then only it will get the focus at the highest level in the government it will prepare the people uh, for that. And in that sense, I would say that the uh, effort which is now currently being made uh, by the government of India, and uh, there are so many institutions. I remember that there have been so many lightning seminars uh, conducted by NAM Center and others. And each time I have been um, really uh, making this particular point that let us think in terms of multi-hazard. Finally, I would like to say that it's not enough really uh, to think in terms of individual disasters or multi-hazard because it's not a problem solving uh, uh, at the same time. Uh, what we need to uh, be interested in is culture, uh, developing a culture of safety. Now, we are looking for the higher objective of developing culture of safety in a country like India where the population is so large and the literacy rate is not very high. Uh, it is very difficult to reach out to every uh, individual uh, to convey this. Uh, and which is why I am um, um, very particular that uh, if we flag the need to look at the culture of safety, I'm very sure that the schools will pick it up uh, the, uh, and the government is going to provide more funding on to, uh, for this and then it, lightning will not be forgotten in a country like India where there are a number of other disasters which distract attention of the 
disaster management authorities. So, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, with that, I would say that this is a, a long journey from uh, Richmond to my uh, dream of uh, uh, multi-hazard risk resilience and culture of safety. Uh, and uh, indeed, this long journey I had to complete with a lightning speed because of the shortage of time. Uh, I, I hope that I have conveyed something to you. And if you want to carry one point from me here, uh, my, uh, I will plead for uh, the culture of safety uh, that we should look for. And this is not some idea, my idea. This is not a new idea. Even um, when we had the Earth Summit, at that time we were talking about safety. But now, since we are so much overwhelmed by the problem, that this has been received attention. So with this, I thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, Professor Mandari. It was uh, so nice uh, uh, presentation. And uh, your, your ideas, opinions regarding uh, the further um, uh, movement of our learning. So thank you indeed for your for the for sharing your experience, and uh, we look forward to hear again from you and share your uh, get your ideas to to work with. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like now meet uh, Professor Gomez. I think he has already fixed his uh, uh, laptop and uh, connection. Uh, Professor Gomez, uh, are you ready? Chandi ma'am? Uh, 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 can you hear me? No, you, you, you still have a problem. No. Yeah, uh, Professor Mandari. Yes, okay, go to the next speaker then. Yeah. Okay. I will come later. Okay. Can I now invite uh, Professor Marianne uh, Cooper, who has been working very hard for the safety of humankind. Uh, before she gets uh, prepared to share her screen, I would like to invite uh, two gentlemen from Sri Lanka, Dr. Ananda Malava Tantri, Country representative of IUCN and uh, Dr. Sarath Premalal, director, former director general of uh, meteorology uh, department, Sri Lanka. Uh, welcome, sir, both of you. Professor Marianne? Yes. Uh, are you ready with the presentation? Oh, yes. Uh, I had backed out of it when you said. Uh, Okay, uh, yeah. just to introduce you, uh, Professor Marian is uh, the Emerita of Emergency Medicine and retired from University of Illinois, Chicago uh, in 2009. She held additional faculty appointment, appointments uh, in the neurology and bioengineering departments. Dr. Cooper was the first physician to be elected a fellow of the American Meteorological Society in 2003, an honor accorded by the AMS Constitution to 0.3 percent of AMS membership, and received an AMS Special Award for her medical studies on lightning victims. Since 2014, she has been managing director of SLNet, African Center for Lightning Electromagnetics Network, uh, a, a pan African network dedicated to reducing deaths, injuries, and property damage from lightning. Uh, Professor Marian, you are welcome and uh, kindly share your uh, ideas and presentation. Thank you. Can you see the presentation now? Yes, I can. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Okay. So, um, thank you for inviting me to speak again, Sri, and certainly thank you to all of Solnet and all of the other presenters today uh, and yesterday uh, for preparing their talks. This is, uh, as I said to Chandima, it's a dream come true to have uh, so much uh, participation and so much 
um, concern about and energy involved now in lightning safety. So thank you to everyone. Okay, I was asked to talk about the USA experience and what we've been doing in the United States. We're privileged to have Donna Franklin, who has been the leader of the Lightning Safety Awareness Week for many, many years on uh, the, um, on the, in the audience as well. And she said that she would be happy to give a, a little bit of a um, reflection on our work then. Um, Okay, I don't know what's happening with my slides if you see this blue stuff. Anyway, um, back in the 1980s, we had uh, many people talking about lightning safety in our uh, in the United States. Whenever there was a lightning incident, someone would uh, call Phil Kreider, or Martin Newman, Ron Holly, me, and we were all telling our particular versions of safety and science. Uh, it was not um, uh, coordinated. Uh, some of us believed that metal still attracted lightning. Um, Shiraz, can you please mute some of these people that are coming in? Okay, let's try again. Okay, we were all speaking from our own experience on our own beliefs. Some of us still thought that lightning uh, was attracted by metals. Some of us thought wearing cleats on our golf shoes might cause more injuries. There were all kinds of misconceptions. Um, and um, we sort of knew each other, but we were each speaking from our own experience. Then some new research came out from Lopez and Holly on interstrike distance. And we came up to, was there, could we expect uh, when the next lightning strike might occur? What was the distance from the last one? Was there a particular danger zone or danger radius that we could expect? Well, it turns out that that research showed um, it, the, the next strike from the first one that you heard, the next strike, could be five to seven miles from that. That meant that by the time you heard thunder, which you can hear for about 10 miles, 16 kilometers, more or less, you're already in danger. Well, we decided that we probably needed to get together and start addressing this um, for lightning safety. So many of these lightning people met at the annual American Meteorological Society meeting then. Uh, we had physicists, you know, Phil Kreider, Mark Newman, uh, meteorologist, Ron Holly, many others. Um, I was one of the physicians that was part of this. We had people from the military, uh, from the rest of the government, athletic trainers, teachers, insurance people, lighting protection, detection. So we had a true multidisciplinary team and we sat around for two days talking with each other and we shared uh, and we taught each other from our own areas of expertise. And we still work together. Uh, we agreed on lightning safety messages that we would all use so that we were consistent, so the media didn't get confused. And we agreed to publish this widely in all of our disciplines. So it was published in the meteorological literature, it was published in the medical literature. And so we started getting it known. Uh, these lightning safety tips including, included uh, identifying safe and not so safe locations from thunderstorm activity, it included safety guidelines for individuals. It included safety guidelines for small groups or when evacuation time for larger groups was less than 10 minutes. Safety guidelines for large groups or when evacuation time was extended so that uh, you had to do um, pre-planning. It also involved uh, action plan, and first aid recommendations for lightning victims, including that it's not dangerous to touch victims after they've been injured, which was uh, certainly a common um, thought in the United States, and I'm sure it's common uh, throughout the world still. Well, in 1999, John Jensenius, who's now head of the National Lightning Safety um, Council and is also on this call now, welcome to John, called Ron Holly and asked him if he would come up to the northeastern United States because um, John lives up in the very northeastern tip 
of the United States, Maine. That's where my husband was born to. And so he wanted to go through um, some of the states, Vermont, New Hampshire, and give lightning safety um, talks to schools and to other venues. So they did that. And um, then in 2000, Noah had some money and it called for proposals for new things. John submitted a proposal for Lightning Safety Week. Uh, Noah already had safety weeks for hurricanes, tornadoes, and many other things. So this was along the same line of, of um, disaster management and disaster mitigation and preparedness. Uh, that proposal was accepted, and in 2001, National Lightning Safety Awareness Week was born. Well, some of the things that we did with Lightning Safety Awareness Week that first year, again, the safety team was multidisciplinary. We invited all of the people who had participated in the lightning safety guidelines, and for many reasons, some of them, um, like Phil Kreider and Martin Newman, uh, were more interested in their lightning research, right, and, and I'm, I'm not uh, saying anything against them. Uh, the people that were more into the public health side of it, the more the physicians and the meteorologists uh, continued on the team. We still have a, a multidisciplinary team. Uh, and we developed materials that first year for 120 different uh, weather offices across the United States for their outreach officers to go out. Uh, part of it was also the Professional Golfers Association worked with us uh, and put out press releases and public service announcements, and they offered two of their professional golfers, Rocco Mediate and Vijay Singh, uh, to not only film posters that we could uh, put up in schools and, and recreation centers and community centers and, and all over the, the country, um, they also recorded public service announcements that we could show on TV. And um, it was a great start. Over the next few years, we had other uh, sports personalities. Siri Molnix is a professional women's uh, soccer player. We had Tori Hunter, professional baseball player. And then we started generalizing more into some of the threats, including uh, water sports, which now is one of the biggest areas of uh, lightning injury in the United States. Uh, in 2003, we adopted when thunder roars go indoors and we got the leon the lightning safety lion who could roar for us okay uh so we have several posters uh again water uh sports um when to go inside uh and it's been quite successful um in addition we have this great video uh, that I'd be happy to share with anybody, or I'm sure uh, John would as well. Uh, it's not just a video, it's an interactive safety game to where a person is in any of these settings, a playground, out on boats, in a um, uh, park, uh, out in the open, in the field. And the person gets to choose whether it's safe or not safe. If it's safe, Leon claps his hands and applauds you. If it's not safe, he gets zapped uh, by lightning. Uh, well, this looks like I may have to stop share for just a second and start again because it seems like it's stuck on that. So let me do that. I apologize for that. Now my Zoom is all messed up. Oh, I am so sorry for this. There we go. I didn't know putting that on would change things, so I apologize. Okay, let's try this again.
<sighs> okay, can you see this now? Are we back? Yes, we are. Yes. Okay. 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 So I apologize. I had no idea that was going to gum things up. Um, okay. So from uh, so there's all kinds of resources. Let's go through some of them. Uh, from 2001 to 2015, NOAA, uh, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, hosted Lightning Safety Week. Uh, over that time, we developed curricula for all ages from three on up, three, age of three on up. Three-year-olds can remember when thunder roars go indoors, as I said yesterday. There's puzzles, all kinds of stickers and things. Um, you've seen some of those lightning hats already for the kids and for the adults. Uh, there's modules for teachers, for the media, uh, packets for coaches. Uh, John has done some incredible animations of lightning formation, lightning science, and mechanisms of injury um, that are on the website that um, are very plain language that you may want to use for teaching. There's all kinds of other things, public service announcements, uh, brochures, and I know as scientists, you all love statistics. There's lots of statistics. Well, since 2015, NOAA had a reorganization and eliminated some of the safety weeks. And so the National Lightning Safety Council grew out of that. Uh, and uh, we still interact with NOAA. Uh, we have uh, produced several short YouTube videos on many topics and, and graphs. There's graphs, pie charts, all kinds of things. And of course, more statistics. All of this is also free to download. Some of the things that you might see on it, if you go statistics, like uh, uh, John's done a great job of making uh, all kinds of graphs and, and pie charts and things for the media. This may be something you want to consider for your media when you start doing lightning education uh, and about the science and about who's injured and when. Get the statistics that you can, uh, the injury information that you can get and put it together by month by day of the week, by, by activity, by uh, gender of who gets injured, um, how many are injured and what kinds of work uh, in sports activities. This also works great with your government. You go to them and say, hey, the people that are being killed are the ones that are out in the rice paddies planting. We need to do something about this. And this is what our statistics show. Well, you want me to talk about the impact of awareness in the United States. Let me show you what it's done. In all honesty, I have to tell you that lightning injuries were decreasing through uh, from 1900 all the way up to when Lightning Injury Prevention Week or Safety Awareness Week started. Part of it was because people were moving to the city so that you can see the percent of rural population decreased. People were moving to safer areas. In addition, we got safer buildings because we got electricity during that, the early part of the 19th century, or the 20th century there, uh, and started getting more substantial housing with wiring and plumbing running through the walls. So in all honesty, it was already decreasing. But let me show you what we've done with Lightning Safety Awareness Week. This is a running 10-year average. When we started in 2001 here, the number of deaths in the United States was about 55 per year on average. We've decreased it to less than half that. It's on a 10 year average now, it's down to 26. We've only had half the number of deaths this year at four that we would expect. We would have expected eight injuries or eight deaths uh, by the 26th of June. So we've made quite an impact. Um, one of the things you need to realize too, at least in developed countries, 90% of people who are injured by lightning survive. So this means that we've not only cut the death rate, we've cut the injury rate. So we've got a lot fewer survivors with all of the problems they have afterwards. I'll mention that a little bit at the end. So I think this has been very successful. It's not, we have given thousands of interviews to uh, TV and newspapers and public radio all over the world and all kinds of, of programs like that. The team has all been involved in this and um, the media has done a wonderful job. So employ your media, they're great, okay? So if you look at the, what this means, we've had 26 deaths and 330 million people uh, last year. That means a fatality rate of less than 1.1 per million. 
So that's about one in every 13 or 14 million people. Uh, that's pretty good. In the United States, more people die falling out of trees, off bicycles, downstairs, tripping on sidewalks, all kinds of things than die from lightning. Uh, and it's fallen, it used to be for over 100 years, lightning was the second highest storm killer uh, in the United States, only exceeded by floods. We've fallen into the third place now. Well, as Ron and I say, we put ourselves out of business and that's one of the reasons we've started doing uh, all of the international work that we've done. This year for uh, the 20th uh, annual Lightning um, Safety Week, uh, we've done lots of social media and blogs. John has been behind this, the whole team has been behind this. Uh, Kim uh, Lohr, who's on the talk as well, or on the, in the audience as well, has just been tremendous with her tweets and Facebook and Instagram. Some of the others, Chris Vygatsky, Chris Schultz, uh, Dyla has been great. Um, we've done lots of videos, media things. And I think Shri is going to show you John's video on International Lightning Safety Day in a few minutes. Okay, so I'm almost at the end. I know I'm probably over time with all my glitches. I apologize. Um, we've only been talking about deaths. As I, as I said, 90%, at least in developed countries, we don't know the percentage in developing countries, at least 90% of lightning injured survive. Well, many survivors, unfortunately, have permanent disabilities. It's like the brain injury that the football players and soccer players have. Um, with memory and learning problems, they can't multitask, they have difficulty learning new things uh, because they can't handle the amount of information they used to do. Uh, they become very easily frustrated and angry. Uh, it's a neurological injury, it's not a burn injury. Because of nerve damage, there may be chronic pain problems, uh, PTSD. Many of these people are unable to return to work and school. So we're not talking just deaths. At some point, right now, I'm talking deaths to all you folks, because that's what we're really concerned about starting with. Eventually, we're gonna start talking about these disabilities as well, because it turns out that the lightning injury is not just to the person injured. It's an injury to the entire family and to the community. If they can't return to work, if they can't return to their, if they can't learn in school. Um, so with that, thank you. I appreciate you inviting me again. And it is just wonderful to have this gathering. Thank you, Sri Ram. Yeah, uh, Professor Marian, thank you so much for sharing your experience all the way from your United States uh, where you, reduced the uh, death uh, and casualties uh, drastically. So thank you so much for the wonderful uh, lesson that you shared to us. May I now request uh, 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 Mr. Ron Holley uh, from Vaisala to share his uh, uh, presentation. Uh, Ron, are you there? Yes, I okay. am. Yeah, okay. Uh, you can share your screen. Uh, in the meantime, I would like to introduce you, you uh, to the group. Ron Hull is, Hole is a meteorological consultant in Oreo Valley, Arizona. Ron has worked extensively in meteorological education issues, particularly those re relating to lightning safety and demographics of lightning victims and damage in the recognized uh, as the world expert on the demographics of lightning injury. He received his BS and MS degrees in meteorology from uh, Florida State University and took additional coursework at the University of Miami. He has authored and co-authored 75 formally reviewed uh, journal papers, 17 books and book chapters, and 334 uh, informal papers. He worked with a uh, NOAA Research Laboratories in Norman, Oklahoma, Boulder, uh, Colorado, Coral uh, Gates, uh, Florida, and Silver Spring, Mar uh, Maryland, as well as uh, more recently uh, with Vaisala in Tuscan, as I told in the beginning. So uh, he has uh, also produced paper on the casualties uh, around the globe. Uh, I would like to invite uh, uh, again, uh, uh, Ron, 
to, to speak on what he has been doing and uh, what should be done on the aspect of uh, lightning and meteorology. Uh, All right, so thank you. Can you hear me and see my screen? Yes, we do. All right, thank you. Good morning. I'm in Arizona. The sun has just come up. Um, lightning is quite an important factor. Um, this is a view from our house on Wednesday night. We ha I'm in Arizona, We're southwestern U.S., in Tucson. You don't see a screen. We can see you. Share your screen, Aaron. Let me check it again. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there you yeah. go. All right. I jumped the gun on that. So and I'm in Arizona in the southwestern part of the United States in Tucson <clears throat> to the south. And we had a fire, forest fire started three weeks ago today. It's still burning. And this is what it looked like from our house on Wednesday night. So lightning started this. We have the exact uh, flash that started it and we're analyzing it. So it's been a major event in our life here every day for the last several weeks. So lightning is important. So I published a paper some years ago with Dr. Lopez and we estimated as a starting point, 24,000 people are killed and 10 th times as many people are injured per year around the world. We find that lightning deaths and injuries are steadily decreasing in developed nations, but they're increasing in developing nations. We have no data for many of the nations with probable large totals of, of deaths. So this is a, a, a call to action for this. We need the studies in many developing nations and we need a lot of prior studies to be updated for a reason that I'll describe in a moment. Marianne showed this figure in a slightly different form uh, before. This is from the National Lightning Safety Council. This one goes back to 1940. And as these are five, 10, and 30 year running averages, and you can see the decrease that's occurred. And the, light, the lightning safety effort in the United States has been during this period. And I prepare these maps every year. They're posted on the council website and the National Weather Service website. You need to do, look at two things, lightning fatalities in terms of the raw numbers. These are by state in the last 10 years but also then you need to weight it by population because the population varies greatly across the country. And uh, see Florida has a large number of deaths, but also does have a, uh, a high rate, but it's a difference between the two places, uh, between the two uh, numbers. So I am um, a half-time employee at Vaisala that owns and operates the Global Lightning Data Set, GLD360 network. And in the last five years, we've averaged uh, about 2 billion events per year. And you can see the locations of um, lightning maxima. As, <clears throat> as a meteorologist, these are very interesting locations. They're over land masses, tend to be toward the lower latitudes and uh, where there's mountains and warm water surrounding them. This, net, this network uses both time of arrival and direction finding, and so it uh, has a lot of advantages. So matching to that figure is this figure, which was in a journal article in 2016, this one over here, and is this is an update with about three more countries added since that paper was published. So we can see the lowest lightning rates are yellow and uh, the this is rates per million people of fatalities. And these are based on published papers from um, many of them, <clears throat> many of them from journals and some of them from uh, conference papers. Anyway, you can see that the developed countries of Europe, North America, and Australia are low rates. There's intermediate rates when you take into account population in a number of countries. And all of the high rates, which I defined as over 5.0, deaths per million per people are in Africa. But notice that a large number of countries have no published data. These are the white shading. So this is the, this is, these are the areas we really need data. So <clears throat> I'd like to emphasize that 
The factors that contribute to the number of reports of lightning casualties in developing countries, I think the most important one is better internet penetration. This is very important. The data from a number of countries in the last 25 years show a major jump in the last five or 10 years as reporting improves. And so this is why I think we need to go back to some of the earlier studies and do them again, because they may not represent what was actually happening. And uh, it would make the numbers appear to go up, but they were there all along. There's also an increasing number of people in, in many of these countries. And much of this larger population is in labor intensive agricultural work, up to 50 to 80% of people in many uh, developing countries are in uh, small farm situations. And this is where the United States was 100 years ago in Europe. Uh, as we saw in the Marianne's figure, the rural population has dropped uh, by a large amount. So much of this larger population has no lightning safe buildings or vehicles available. And there's been no improvement in lightning awareness. That's why we're having this meeting. Uh, detection is now possible. Warnings are possible. Medical care needs to be developed. So all of these factors put together for developing countries means that our reports are increasing on things that were happening all along, but we also have more people continuing to live and work in unsafe, uh, lightning unsafe situations. <clears throat> Let's consider uh, the, the most common scenario in a developing country is uh, agricultural workers. Let's think of a, a group of people out in the rice paddies or in a, a maize field. They, if they want to be s protected from lightning, they need, need to receive reliably accurate data in a timely manner. They need to react to the threat. They need to have a place to go while in the field this mouse keeps jumping. Is it possible to provide buses or other vehicles out in the field that you can simply go into in a hurry? Who decides when to stop work? And is there a penalty for not working when lightning is a threat? Uh, in many cases, people are out working in the rain because what, when there's less lightning because it's cooler than it was during the heat of the day. So is there a penalty for stopping because you think you might be in danger? So these are all factors we've considered and these are all parts of a, co a complete plan. <clears throat> it published this paper in the journal last December for Bangladesh, and we related GLD lightning strokes and deaths per million. And we have a tremendous maximum in the northeastern part of Bangladesh based on the lightning data. I mean, really strong maximum compared to everywhere else. And we have a fairly good correlation with the number of fatalities per million people in that area. There certainly are others, and there's a lot of other factors. But this was pretty encouraging. And we take, took into account the, the farming population in another figure. It's more complicated. Um, so we thought we'd go to Malawi and paper with Dr. Kalinda Kafi in Malawi, a conference uh, two years ago. So he had lightning da data for about half of the provinces or districts of the country. Here's the lightning density showing a nice maximum along the east coast, which is getting up against Lake uh, Malawi, uh, which I'm not sure that's the right name. Anyway, but the problem is that it didn't relate nearly as well. And we're also missing the data for quite a few places. So this image here is perhaps the ideal, but this is this is the reality that it doesn't work quite so well. So we, we need to have a lot more studies like this. So in conclusion, we need to have an end-to-end -end lightning warning process. You need to identify a lightning safe place in advance. You need to provide reliable and accurate lightning data from a detection network, a way for the people to receive the data. You need to provide the data to the people that really need it need to have a place to go to and then stay there until the lightning is clear. So unless all these steps are taken, this is not, a, you do not have a complete process. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Ron, uh, for this uh, wonderful information that uh, you have gathered from around the world. And uh, uh, we get to know about uh, the situation in different parts of the world. So thank you indeed for sharing all these uh, information.
Now, I would like uh, to invite the next speaker, uh, Mr. Gopakumar uh, from India. Uh, Mr. Uh, Gopakumar, are you there? Yes. Good evening. Good evening. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gopakumar is uh, the managing director at uh, Cape Electric Private Limited since 1996. And uh, had worked uh, as a managing director at OBO Betterman uh, in India. Uh, he is the member of ETD 20 and ETD 30 at and uh, uh, National Building Code of uh, India Electrical Committee in 2016, uh, and uh, Bureau of Indian Standard. Uh, member of he is the member of IEC MT3, MT12, and MT41. PT 6034, 364, 8 and 3 chapter, I think, and uh, work, working group 43, TC 64. And uh, uh, the IEC is International Electrotechnical Commission. He is the member of IEC WG03 and WG05, SC and uh, SC 37A, International Electrotechnical Commission. So I would like to invite uh, this uh, engineer, uh, he's very se senior engineer and working very hard to protect uh, lives from electrical hazards as well as lightning. Uh, Mr. Uh, Gopakumar, please uh, share your presentation. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> good evening, uh, Sriram, uh, Marianne, uh, Dr. Chandima and all the other friends uh, in the uh, webinar. So I start from uh, the place where I stopped yesterday. Uh, you know, when it comes to India, uh, the problem of uh, lightning, you must have seen in the newspapers yesterday. Uh, one day there were uh, a death uh, totaling about 110 in the northern, uh, northeastern part of uh, India, especially in uh, uh, the places uh, which is very close to Nepal, especially Bihar, we call the status Bihar and uh, uh, Uttar Pradesh, there were, uh, you know, severe uh, lightning uh, uh, strikes yesterday and a lot of people passed away. But okay, uh, regarding our, uh, the training programs, uh, uh, we started the lightning awareness classes during 2000 or 2002. Then from 2006 onwards, uh, along with the Chandima, we did a lot of awareness classes. And as I said yesterday in 2020, uh, three months back, the National Disaster, the, the State Disaster Management Authority told that uh, due to large scale awareness, uh, the number of accidents uh, or the number of deaths uh, had come down. Now, regarding the latest uh, activities which we are doing, uh, in 2017, we did, uh, we arranged a seminar in four cities in India. This was a two days uh, program uh, in August. Uh, one was conducted in Bangalore. Uh, this is mainly for the uh, the uh, the industries in uh, around Bangalore. Then uh, another program in Chennai, uh, the south to South Indian states. Uh, the other one in Delhi, uh, New Delhi, near to you know the uh, national capital. Uh, then we organized one more two-day seminar in uh, Bombay. So uh, the, the, these were actually very successful uh, programs, uh, especially in Bangalore and Chennai, there were a lot of uh, participants. Uh, but uh, after this event, uh, we changed the, the way of working a little bit because uh, uh, when, when we talk about lightning, uh, we, uh, lightning protection, especially to engineering community, we also uh, started uh, talking about electrical safety because both are uh, interrelated because mostly the electrical engineers are, uh, are doing lightning protection. And when we talk about uh, lightning protection, most of the engineers think that uh, uh, the so-called advanced rod absorb the lightning and uh, send it to the uh, earth. This is the uh, concept which, which people were always generally uh, thinking of. So as a result, we tried to combine electrical safety and uh, lightning protection together. However, in the... Uh, this 2020 September, we thought of making uh, four, uh, uh, you know, again, two days workshops in four cities, especially in September uh, uh, 7 to 16. But anyway, because of the COVID situation, we will not be able to do this uh, program. We, we have to change uh, the date or we have to 
may be probably shifted to next year. Uh, actually, we planned it after, just after the, the uh, ICLP, which was planned uh, in Sri Lanka. The, the next week, we thought of doing these workshops in uh, India, but uh, anyway, it is gone. Uh, now, during this, uh, uh, the, the, actually, the time uh, of this COVID, the lockdown uh, gave a lot of opportunity for us to uh, focus more into the webinars, especially on electrical safety. You know, the situation in India is even if we call engineers for a, a class free of charge, people don't attend because uh, the, the, uh, the interest shown to a training class or the interest shown to increase the knowledge, this is very less. So, uh, but this COVID anyway, it gave a lot of opportunity. Uh, I was making, I started a, a small lightning protection class on 25th of uh, March because our lockdown started on 24th. So 25th, I did a program, a webinar for about uh, 20 people. But then what has happened is uh, after this first program, almost 42 days, uh, I was doing uh, the program regularly. After three, four days, the, the number of participants had increased to something about uh, uh, 200 uh, to 250 and there were there were uh, approximately three four days uh, there were approximately about 490 plus uh, participants the maximum limit was 500 so we could not go beyond 500 so continuously we me and my team we were doing uh, uh, webinars on uh, lightning safety uh, search protection devices electrical safety what is uh, earthing how to do it and so on now, at the end of these uh, webinars, uh, in the May 6th and 7th, uh, the authorities, uh, authorities in the sense, the electrical uh, inspectorate of uh, India, government of India, they told me that, uh, uh, why don't you make a book based on this particular uh, webinar so, so that it can be distributed and uh, it, it will be made useful? Because one of the big problem which we face in India is a misinterpretation of the standards. We have beautiful standards from uh, IEC. All the modern standards are there uh, in India, but uh, no one buy a standard and the people don't read it and understand it uh, and make it. If somebody comes with uh, a name, a modern lightning protection, advanced lightning protection, which is you know mostly called for ESE or the dissipation array systems and all, people normally jump uh, to these uh, systems. So, however, after this uh, seminars, uh, I will show you my book uh, yesterday. Uh, I could not uh, show it. Uh, I will uh, show it now. So, this uh, I am sure you are able to see the uh, the PDF. So we, uh, we, we uh, put the name as uh, the missing link. Uh, the missing link is nothing but the link is nothing but the knowledge. Uh, the missing knowledge is the biggest problem uh, in India. Also, you know, electrical safety with respect to electrical safety, we miss a lot of uh, uh, connections, especially the touch voltage reduction measures are missing. So we put uh, the name as missing link. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, uh, you know, the, we could get uh, we could get the uh, support from almost all the top uh, electrical uh, safety organizations uh, in the government of India and various uh, state governments. So they have written forward for the book. So uh, the first one is from the government of India, and these two gentlemen are from uh, two states. Uh, and again, uh, there were about six, seven uh, forwards we could get. Uh, the subject of the seminar, uh, the book starts with uh, what is the basic of uh, protection? Say, for example, uh, what is the protective measure uh, in a building? Basic protection, fault protection, what does uh, mean by basic protection and what is uh, fault protection? So from here, with this uh, background, uh, this book mainly concentrates on the uh, safety measure of fault protection, which is called as uh, automatic disconnection. So with this, we go to the, the, the next uh, subject was a little bit about earthing and uh, you know, uh, what, what is this uh, protective equipotential bonding, how you should do, because uh, 
as yesterday mary and told a substantial building a substantial building means uh, the electrical systems are there plumbing systems are there but what is missing in india is interconnection of all these uh, you know technically called exposed and extraneous conductive parts these are never interconnected in india people think that uh, interconnecting uh, body of different items are a danger so as a result we always try to keep the things separate to separate so this is one of the even if we have a very good lightning protection system in a building mostly it won't work because uh, the 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 concept of equipotentialization never exists so the book uh, i try to uh, interfere or i try to interpret what exactly is written in the books uh, especially <clears throat> the exposed uh, you know uh, how to make uh, equipotential system and for example the definitions of earthing and say for example symbols of earthing there are different the symbols of earthing safety earthing clean earthing uh, chassis earthing and so on the different symbols were explained uh then what is how how equipotential bonding has to be done in a building and what is you know <clears throat> different explanations but the same subject uh, of uh, uh, equipotential bonding because uh, even if we make the, the the best lightning protection system since the, the metal things in a building are separate uh, uh, actually lightning protection system won't work so this uh, again uh, lightning protection system and how to connect the lightning protection system along with the uh, the the uh, the total uh, metallic objects in a building so all these uh, functions were explained then i skip a few of the system the, then the 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 system air thing called as you know t t t t n t n c s t n s how these things are working and what is the concept and how to make it uh, happen inside a building because all these are related to electrical safety then uh, uh, you know you can see here what is the the mistakes which is uh, done in india the missing link here uh, the connection is missing as a result uh, the <clears throat> fire due to short circuit happen in india especially a lot of fire accidents are happening inside building and annually about uh, uh, 12 to 13000 people are affected uh, because of fire and uh, the electrical uh, uh, you know uh, electrocution uh, <clears throat> due to fire and electrocution then uh, we try to include uh, the uh, lightning protection as well in this book uh, starting with uh, what exactly the lightning protection air thing has to be done what is a type a air thing type b air thing and how this has to be carried out in a building and if you have a building how to carry out to type a and a type b air thing uh then we go to the lightning protection system little bit from the standard basically these are uh, i'm sure uh, very useful for the um, engineers with the uh, pictures uh, what exactly has to be done and how the calculations are done and so on <clears throat> then uh, included uh, some interesting pictures uh, how you, how the separation distance the safety distance has, has to be calculated and so on then finally we also tried to include uh, a subject a chapter on uh, i skip some of the electrical safety subjects so finally uh, you know trying to include uh, uh, this particular part uh, for example what you are seeing is a, a telecom installation and a lightning protection system which is called as the dissipation array system installed in telecom installations across india uh, not thousands but more than maybe 10000 of uh, such uh, uh, lightning protection systems are installed in india i came across uh, a failure uh, about 3 years back one of the very critical and a large telecom installation uh, the customer had installed uh, the system called as uh, you know the dissipation array system uh, and there was a lightning strike and the whole tower and the whole electronic apparatus in this installation burned out so there was a total disaster then the customer uh, has has uh, written to the supplier of the dissipation array system and told that uh, look uh, as per your as per your advice i put your system but now my whole uh, thing has burned so this uh, the the interesting there was an interesting reply from the uh, this particular manufacturer 
and the manufacturer has written back to the uh, telecom person saying that uh, look gentlemen i gave uh, model number x which is able to handle 30000 volts of lightning probably the lightning happened in your uh, place is maybe more than 30000 uh, volts uh, as a result your complete uh, facility had burned down so now uh, i am attaching a new offer for a new model which can handle up to 40000 volts of lightning so you change this uh, uh, this dissipation array system to a new model then you are protected but uh, and this particular customer without uh, understanding or without uh, even reading the basics from the google uh, he just bought this uh, extra thing and installed then after two years again there was a lightning strike and total burning uh, <clears throat> so what we did is uh, we also tried to include this particular session on uh, the early streamer emission which is you know a non standard lightning protection system what is happening in india more than 70 percentage of the lightning protection system installed in india are efc and almost 100 percentage of solar pv installations uh, they follow early streamer emission system and the early streamer emission concept which is followed in india is a little bit uh, different than what is even written in the nfc standard so here uh, the esc manufacturers they educate the market in such a way that uh, i have an advanced uh, lightning protection system uh, so advanced in the sense uh, they compare with the franklin uh, rod system franklin rod is very old system i have an advanced system modern system and my modern system uh, you know absorb uh, the lightning and through this particular uh, the insulated uh, down conductor the complete lightning energy is uh, sent to the earth and that's it they don't do any equi potential bonding so this is uh, so what i tried to explain in the book is uh, what is uh, uh, the indian esc concept this is actually not the international esc concept this is a typical indian esc concept and then try to include a picture from the esc standard this is actually from the nfc standard i try to include the nfc concept which is explaining you know a lot of uh, equipotential bonding system but practically the concept in india is not even following of course the concept of esc itself is wrong or bad we didn't accept it but the esc which is uh, which is uh, sold and uh, studied in india is totally different this is uh, even uh, you know worst than what is told in the nfc standard so like this we made uh, a book uh, uh, now we are printing about uh, 10000 uh, copies and uh, this will be circulated to almost all uh, electrical uh, uh, you know engineering people and so on uh, now we are doing a lot of uh, activities but the problem is when it comes to uh, the the uh, one moment when it comes to the actual subject uh, we face a lot of uh, competition from uh, competition in the sense uh, i would say it is not a technical competition but the competition from uh, people uh, 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 i'm sure you are able to see my screen one moment let me share it again yeah i am sure you are able to see the full screen yes we can yeah thank you now this as i said this particular thing a wooden pole and a, a, like a bike tire at the top this was uh, really uh, Uh, the 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 bringing the whole country the knowledge of the whole country into a kind of a rubbish situation and uh, the the uh, the other interesting part is lot of government organizations in india including the national disaster management authority because i could get these photos from a link which is related to the national disaster management authority and the national meteorological department it's really uh, you know um, Uh, interesting that these people even without uh, any understanding about lightning they are putting such nonsense in their websites so <clears throat> this is uh, what is happening practically in india and uh, you i could this was uh, you know uh, the one of the executive summary which i could uh, take from the uh, the uh, national disaster management authorities website they say for example imd internet indian meteorological department they are supporting and funding this kind of uh, lightning protection system uh, 
and somewhere they say that uh, the big corporates in india those who have uh, the csr fund the csr fund stands for the corporate social responsibility fund large companies uh, uh, 2 to 3% of their net profit they are supposed to spend for uh, social activity so uh, these ngos or the people who are, those who are working behind uh, such uh, nonsense they get lot of money and they go around the country and they they do you know uh, uh, these uh, kind of uh, uh, installations so our next fight actually it started with uh, this kind of uh, the the kind of people those who are doing this installation as a result what we did is uh, as as i said yesterday uh, we four of us uh, uh here dr nagabhushana dr pradeep dikshit and myself we had uh, prepared a note and now we are this was uh, recently we came across information regarding a new type of lightning protection arrangement uh, in which a metallic uh, rim tube is mounted at top of a tall wooden pole uh, with uh, trifurcated at the top it is claimed that this can protect a whole village and apparently installed in some places so then we uh go to the uh, for example um, uh you know the the introduction what exactly people are doing then uh, how lightning the actual uh, uh, the, the dangers behind this particular uh, item then what exactly is happening during a lightning what is uh, upward streamer downward leader and all those things are explained then the step voltage uh, touch voltage is explained the forest fires are explained then uh, you know uh, the the uh, different with different photographs and we made an advice uh, saying that uh, children please don't go be, uh, go near to this especially during lightning uh, if you can dismantle it uh, as soon as possible please do it then uh, with the conclusion considering all the above it is evident that the new lightning protection arrangement cannot be considered as giving uh, even basic protection Uh, for getting protection of large areas like a village on the other hand uh, it may result uh, in avoidable injuries burns etc and possible fatalities over relatively large area consider possible hazard uh, uh, to unsuspecting uh, uh, people it is advisable not to depend on such uh, systems so this is actually a, what i have shown is a small portion of a large fight because uh, uh, once when we start uh, you can be sure that that the uh, since we are uh, telling that some of the even the government organizations are doing such nonsense uh, sorry to use the word but uh, uh, if we if we really wanted to you know you know strike back we have to use uh, some <laughs> illogical words sorry for that uh, so this is a you know a fight for the for the uh, uh, for a long time however we are actively doing such uh, things uh, under our name under the name of sisa lark and so on uh, but more than lightning protection system last two years our focus had a little bit changed towards the electrical safety but anyway now both are clubbed together and we are back to the track so by this i would like to stop the presentation uh, i would request uh, Uh, okay uh, uh mr J uh, gopal kumar thank you very much for very very interesting and uh, useful presentation uh, uh it was uh, wonderful to learn is particularly the people who are working on disaster management and uh, uh, working on the humanitarian organization to know uh, what uh, fake uh, items uh, can be uh, seen in the market found in the market or sold in the market this is uh, this was very very important and uh, for you there is a question i have seen from uh, i think mitchell would you would you uh, ask the question by yourself mitchell yes thank you um kumar thank you very much for the uh, excuse me uh, gopa um thank you very much for the presentation it was it was uh very informative and i think uh, direct to the point the question i have for you is um the iectc 81 is currently um 
as an ad hoc group is studying the benefit of establishing a conformity assessment program for the IEC standards for lightning protection in general. Um, do you think that uh, this would benefit uh, your problem or, or be of benefit to solving your problem and that it would specifically be addressed, uh, one of the items that would be addressed would be conformity uh, of people, certification of people and their ability to meet the standard, uh, whether it's installers, but specifically in your example, design engineers. Um, I think it would certainly identify their qualifications in understanding the standard, um, but it would also lead them towards uh, getting the training, pushing them towards getting the training necessary to, uh, to be certified. Uh, I'd like your input on that. Uh, <clears throat> one moment. Yeah, uh, uh, I hope it's a morning there in uh, there for Michel. Uh, good morning, uh, Michel. Good morning, so, thank you. Yeah, it will be definitely, it will be useful uh, for us. Uh, at the moment, we are trying to club our, uh, uh, our uh, you know, the, the awareness classes based on the IEC 62713. We use the pictures and we use the explanations from those standards. Plus, we have uh, our own database, which we could uh, develop for the last few years, uh, maybe last 20 years, in fact. So we use uh, such things, but uh, we actually expect uh, a lot of support from the international community, because uh, if I go there, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm doing a lot of uh, the, the uh, NGO or, uh, or activities, which is not related to my business, but still finally people look at me that, okay, this gentleman is a businessman. so. You know, he may be talking something which is which is benefiting for his business. As a result, I don't go more into the into the problem. For example, the government the agencies, those who are doing this, uh, I cannot go and directly fight with them because you know they think that uh, okay, this gentleman is a businessman and he is uh, fighting for his business. So as a result, I keep silent in uh, that area. But uh, if uh, all of you can help, uh, especially. Uh, Anirban and the other uh, the the uh, community the electrical safety, sorry the lighting protection community people uh, from India and uh, abroad of course if you can support uh, we can take it to a great extent we can reduce uh, we actually we there a lot of things are there to do but uh, you know coordinating uh, be, the, 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 uh, with the size of the country with a large population with a lot of uh, uh, different uh, people involved into the activity. It's a little bit difficult to organize it very well. But of course, uh, we expect uh, the support from you, Michel. Yes, uh, certainly we'd, uh, we're hundred percent behind uh, supporting all of the uh, SAL net uh, efforts. Um, I think uh, Malaysia is a member of TC81, but I don't think India is. I'm pretty sure India is not a participating nation. Perhaps you could get some input to me um, or, um, or we can talk offline. Uh, but I think it's important because the standard would be international standard. It does, it's not just for the nations that are participating in the development of it. So I think it's important to get this input and I think the biggest need perhaps in the, in the conformity assessment area is to make sure that anyone from any country that comes into uh, India, USA, uh, anywhere else, uh, that, that they're uh, certified and we know at least that they have a, a knowledge level. Uh, obviously, there would be individual issues associated with the various national committees, so we would have to take those into account. But the, the point right now is we're trying to decide whether this is something that's worth doing. Uh, many developed countries already have their own certification program, so it's not a large loss if they don't. But many of the... Uh, uh, excuse me, developed countries. Many of the developing countries, though, I think it would be particularly useful for. So um, we'll speak offline. Thank you. Yes, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, thank we are, you so we are actually, uh, and, uh, you know, Gopal Kumar, yeah. for your wonderful presentation and uh, Mitchell putting the question and uh, raising the, these issues. And of course, yeah. the community is uh, behind you to protect protect the life of people. Thank you indeed. 
and uh, i would uh, like to move on to the another speaker <coughs> uh mr man thapa uh, are you there mr man thapa yes sir i am here so thank you so much uh, and i i can see uh, mr anil pokrel uh, the chief executive of disaster management uh, risk uh, risk reduction and management authority of nepal uh, joining with us today welcome sir to the to the meeting dr sriram thank you so much for inviting and and such a delight uh, to be part of this discussion this evening uh, thank you so much yeah you're most welcome uh mr thapa mr man thapa is uh, currently a pro program manager of adp country representation of nepal and he had worked very long uh, at the undp as a project manager un uh, uh, working at uh, in nepal and uh, as a program specialist in bangladesh undp bangladesh chief technical advisor for disaster risk management undp banda ase indonesia advisor for disaster risk management uh, uh, authority of uh, undp in sri lanka uh, project manager disaster management specialist undp maldives disaster management program advisor undp in nepal and uh, he is the fellow uh, humphrey fellow uh, on uh, natural resource management at cornell university itaka new york usa mr thapa i welcome you and invite you for the uh, talk uh, that you have been doing in nepal uh, as a disaster uh, manager risk manager uh, you put up you take up uh, you took up the lightning issue as a major issue in in nepal and in, in this region uh, i heartily welcome you and uh, i would like to invite you for the talk um thank you siram sir um good evening to all uh, i'm in kathmandu right now uh, i would like to thank um, the entire organizers uh, for giving this opportunity to share uh, a little initiative that we are undertaking in nepal under the um, initiative called nepal preparedness partnership uh, which is a program under the asian disaster preparedness center currently working on uh, in six countries uh, asian countries um let me start with uh, how we came to this uh, interesting field uh, working together with uh, the government of nepal uh, the academicians like uh, sir i'm sure uh, and then uh, center like nepal uh, academy of science and technology local ngos media and others uh, in fact this program uh, started in 2007 uh, 17 in nepal Uh, while we started this program what we did first is that we reviewed the district wise data uh from all uh, 77 districts uh, of nepal maintained by ministry of home affairs and based on that um, data which uh, we see from three uh, specific perspective one uh, the number of people killed um, annually in each district uh, number of families affected and property destroyed so based on that data uh, for 10 years we selected 30 most disaster prone districts of the country Uh, comprising three ecological zones uh, mountain uh, hill and tarai which is the southern flatland of the country and also at that time we had this new um, structure um, federalism we have seven provinces so those 30 districts cover um, the um, three ecological zones and um, seven provinces uh, just to add on that one like um, the disaster in the mountain areas of nepal uh, may be different than that of the uh, tarai uh, the southern flatlands so that's how we selected we selected those uh, 30 district and also um, after selecting the district we did a baseline survey in each those selected district uh, and our major target uh, responders were uh, locally registered um, ngos working on development disaster both Uh, the district disaster management um, authority that and uh, sorry the uh, uh, relief committee now it is district disaster management committee and the nepal red cross plus few other private sector and other media also and uh, based on that um, information that we collected from 30 districts uh, it was primarily um, uh, tell us two major um, uh, issues on disaster management in nepal one the capacities of the local actors and also the um, the major disaster threat in that uh, area 
This is where uh, we came to know that the lightning um, in Nepal for the last 10, 15 years is one of the major silent killers um, in, in Nepal. Um, around um, I, this morning, I checked last 10 years data. Um, I think around 12% um, of total death due to disaster in Nepal is um, only by lightning. So you can imagine when uh, Marianne uh, made a presentation earlier, um, you can imagine a country like US and Nepal, uh, the number of deaths between this country. In our case, we have around 110 people annually killed by uh, lightning alone. The second interesting thing which we found after the assessment was there are hardly any agencies working on protection against lightning in Nepal. These two factors, the number of deaths that has increased due to lightning in Nepal and not a, a number of agencies working on lightning that um, motivate us to work um, in this field along with under the leadership of Mr. Paul Mafiers and Dr. Sridhar Sarba. So after this um, assessment uh, report, uh, we uh, met uh, under the leadership of Minister of Home Affairs as uh, ADPC works under the Minister of Le uh, Home Affairs. We met with um, uh, Nepal Academy of Science and Technologies, uh, media people, private organizations, and local NGOs working on disaster management. And we initially, we designed um, a one-day orientation program um, uh, targeting primarily the engineers uh, and the lo locally elected representatives. Um, and then we organized the uh, one-day training twice in two, two uh, locations is prone to disaster or lightning and also um, based after the uh, input suggestion from the participants. So we revised the course and then we organized a three-day training program. And also we did um, post-training assessment and um, also I'll share later on how that has implicated in the policy implications. Uh, as I said earlier, based on the review of tenders data, um, managed by MOHA, um, we, uh, we uh, were able to uh, design some training program on PAL. Uh, while designing this training program, uh, largely we work with the Nepal Academy of Science and Technology, private sectors, uh, Ministry of Home Affairs, obviously academia and local event and organizations. And initially we organized a uh, one day uh, orientation in two sites which are um, equally prone to uh, lightning. Uh, the participants were um, engineers uh, working uh, both government and non-government uh, central and local levels um, and academia, private sector, media and so on and so forth. And after these two orientation program, we had a, a follow-up meeting with these participants and they uh, were quite happy uh, participating in this training program. They said that this is like a eye opening for them, but this is not enough because we just share what is lightning, you know, and they want to know more about how we can protect uh, ourselves and properties in, 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 in the, um, uh, on, on the threat of lightning. So after this discussion, we came back to Kathmandu and again had another round of meeting with all these major stakeholders. And um, under the leadership of Sri Ram Sarma, we uh, designed a three-day training program. And um, we organized five uh, three-day training program in different lightning prone parts of the country. And um, after this training program, uh, we, we um, can see that uh, there are large number of uh, people organizations are asking to organize uh, the tra more training programs at the field uh, level. And also uh, the growing number of people and organizations are uh, interested on lightning protection installation uh, into the premises and the building. Um, while doing so, we also um, uh, see the interest of the participants to share their knowledges and expertise and challenges. Uh, so initially they, they uh, developed a WhatsApp group and now around uh, 60, 70 people regularly chat on this uh, WhatsApp group and share information on what they are doing on uh, prediction against lightning, what are the challenges and what's, um, how we can manage those challenges. And while uh, working on this one, um, uh, we develop a PAL standard, which we have shared with many colleagues, organizations, including the uh, Nepal Academy of Science and Technology for their endorsement. We develop a very good, uh, very simple uh, poster in Nepali, which has been now widely used by um, NGOs, INGOs, uh, schools, uh, health posts, and other uh, development uh, practitioners uh, working at the field level. 
Also, we have uh, around eight minute long video, basically in what is uh, lightning, around the one uh, 90 seconds uh, public service announcement, which was uh, earlier broadcasted by uh, the local FM station in uh, Nepal, uh, covering a large part of the country. And also we have developed a training manual. And as I said earlier, uh, this uh, training manual, which, is, uh, which has been used by uh, many um, organizations, both government and non-government, in designing and organizing this uh, training program, Protection Against Lightning in Nepal. Um, the same thing, uh, five training, uh, we conducted around 147 uh, participants, largely government um, officials, uh, engineer, elected representative, uh, and other uh, civil servant, plus the um, local government and, um, actors working at the field level. And, and these are the products that we have. Um, in case of the training program, um, uh, as I said earlier, the uh, government participants were uh, more than half um, of the total participants, and they come from uh, all three uh, layers of government, federal, province, uh, municipal, or local level. Uh, similarly, we have um, a few numbers of media and also uh, private sector uh, uh, participants uh, participated in this one. And uh, let me tell you that um, those people who participated from private sectors in these training programs are now they're installing these uh, lightning protection systems in their uh, factories and office uh, buildings. And a couple of those NGOs, uh, colleagues who participated in the training program, they are replicating uh, the trainings and the our nesting materials in their, um, in their locality or their uh, premises. Thank you. This is all uh, from my side. If you, I'm sure there might be questions and queries. Um, I will, uh, because of the time constraint, I may not be able to answer all these questions, but please feel free to write uh, me on my email, which I will um, post to you in a while. And also, whenever time permits, please uh, visit uh, adpc.net website. Uh, all these informations are there. You can use all our products uh, to save um, people's life. And this is just a simple initiative that we have undertaken in Nepal. And I'm sure that, as I said earlier, the um, number of people killed uh, annually in Nepal is growing due to lightning. And with all this um, hearing from the previous speakers today and yesterday, I'm sure that we can do a lot together, even in Nepal, in other parts of the world, to reduce the uh, risk of lightning. Uh, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, Man, sir, uh, for a wonderful presentation and uh, uh, your uh, noble initiative to mitigate the loss of lives and uh, property in, in this uh, uh, country, as well as uh, taking the initiative to the Asian Disaster Preparedness Center, Bangkok, uh, to, to hold such uh, training programs in the region. So I think it will uh, be materialized uh, in the days to come, uh, or I would say very uh, shortly. Uh, thank you indeed. And if uh, anybody has uh, any questions uh, to Mr. Mantapa, please drop your question on the chat box. Uh, before moving on to the next presentation by Professor Colin Price, I, I'm not sure if uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Chandima is ready with the presentation. If not, I will move on to Professor uh, Colin Price. Chandima, are you there? Uh, yeah, Shri. Hopefully it will work this time. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Uh, Mr. Colin, uh, Colin, is it okay that uh, Chandima comes in here? Sure, no problem. No problem. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Chandima, you go ahead, go ahead with the presentation. Okay. So, sorry for the disturbance last uh, in the last occasion. Uh, I'll try to go a little faster uh, and uh, not going into the details of the presentation very much, but uh, you can, if you want some expanded uh, presentation, especially for those who are interested in having their own uh, lightning centers, then we can even have another webinar later on. So yesterday I showed you that uh, what we expect from a lightning center uh, I'm not going into the details of that. And also in the uh, yesterday's presentation, I showed you what we can do through a lightning center. Th there is a, a large number of 
things that we can do. But uh, one LC need not uh, go for all the objectives, all, all the targets, but uh, you can select uh, what would be your targets or your objectives depending on the, the type of LC model that you are going to adapt. So that today I'm starting from this one, the, the, the start and roll. Now, uh, you see that uh, if you're starting an LC, uh, sorry for this uh, rather crowded uh, uh, slide. I was trying to uh, put everything uh, in a compact uh, uh, presentation. We, we need to go through a certain procedure and there are some essential items. Let me check one by one uh, very briefly. First, we need a driver, a leader. So usually uh, when we uh, go for an LC, a lightning center, it usually comes from one person, just like for an example, the Nepal center uh, was initiated by Sri Ram. Uh, in Bangladesh in 2004, it was Munir, and uh, uh, in, in uh, India, uh, Anirban uh, gave the initial <coughs> force into that. And in Uganda, it was Richard and Zambia Foster like that. But there is one very important thing that is, as soon as possible, you have to multiply the number of drivers. Otherwise, a center will go through a natural death sooner or later. This is what I have experienced in, in more than about seven, eight countries. Whenever there is one person driving the bus and he keeps on driving without having supportive drivers, it collapses and that happened at several places and uh, sometimes even two drivers may not be enough. Let me give you one example from my own experience. In Malaysia, we started the Center of Excellence on Lightning Protection in 2008 and uh, during a 10 year period, we came to the apex of the field and there were two drivers, myself and uh, Professor uh, Zain Al Qadir. So we went through many, many peaks, achieving at the highest international level. But suddenly in 2018, I left, I decided to leave uh, UPM uh, because of some uh, better offers. Then within few months P gap, uh, Prof. Zaina Kadir also left for another university. And within about two to three months, this wonderfully built up child was collapsed. So this is something that very important. Now, for an example, if you take the, the Aklanet in Africa, Richard was the driving force at the beginning and then Mary Ann Cooper came into the scene. The two are now driving it uh, just like uh, super speedsters, uh, racing car drivers, wonderful. And uh, at the same time, I, I have seen during the last few years, Mary Ann is collecting more and more drivers into the, into the bus which is extremely important uh, for, for, uh, for an LC to thrive successfully. And this is a good lesson for Foster as one other, or two, three, and, and lessons for uh, uh, Anirban and uh, uh, Sri Ram as well. And uh, then the next thing is the platform. What is platform? It is uh, the institute where you establish, under which you establish the LC, select it carefully in a way that you can work with them and uh, make sure that the platform is not going to wobble 
uh, as the LC is growing up, they will select a core team. The core team is something that the driver, the initial driver should very carefully select a person, the, a, a team of people with whom the driver can work cordially. Again, you have to select them very carefully. Then the LC model. This is very important. Are you going to start the Lightning Center as a business entity? University or institute funded entity, NGO, INGO, not for profit, but charity. Make sure that you very carefully <coughs> decide. You can change it at a later stage, but at the beginning, select it very carefully. And then the roadmap and time plan, this is very important. You can't move forward if you do not have a proper roadmap and time plan. This is a good lesson for many LCs, which started moving forward without a good roadmap. And <coughs> they, they found a lot of difficulties as they move on. Then advisory team, you can select an advisory team. But let me tell you something. When I look at uh, all the uh, lighting centers that I have worked with, the least successful or least useful item I have seen in all these else's is the advisory team. It gives a very good posh look, uh, 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 quite a, a nice look to your LC uh, on the papers. But unless you define the roles of the advisors at the very beginning and start giving them work to do, which they have agreed to do, the advisory team become just a sleeping tiger without any use uh, for the LC. Then finally, you establish the LC. When you are establishing the LC, my usual practice, I say my usual practice because whenever I was working for some LCs uh, to be as, uh, established in several other countries, the best thing I could suggest them is start the or inaugurate the LC with a big show, just like an international conference, international trade show or, or something by which you can attract the political and media attention to that. And then we go to the next one. Uh, uh, yeah. Sorry. Then we go to the, uh, the, the roadmap and time plan. Develop your roadmap according to the LC model. If it is a business model, it should be one way. If it is a, a non-profit earning but income generating entity, it should be another way then give priority to income source. This is very important. Most failures so far are due to the lack of funding. So I think Marianne could give you some good insight into that. Why Acclaim tried successfully, whereas some centers could not go forward. And if they see a research oriented entity officiated under a university, the best thing is to look for international funding, national and international funding. I have given a list there. Then if the LCE is oriented towards society development, recognized by an established state institute or NGO, or if you're self-standing as a reputed institute, then there are various funding sources and the best thing, rather than tabulating these institutes, I, without taking the permission, I put the name of Professor Mary Ann Cooper. She is the best person who can give you the advice. 
but please check with her with an email. Don't call her. Uh, so first come to an agreement that uh, she is uh, okay and free. Then if your LC is a self-standing business entity, one of the best things you can do is have a principal partner. For an example, say that if your center is looking for distributing uh, lightning protection systems, then look for a good company and make sure that the company sells scientifically proven lightning protection systems. As Mr. Gopakuba has uh, very nicely and clearly figured out, Asian countries, not only Asian countries, even European countries, but especially South Asia and Southeast Asia, Malaysia is flooded with uh, lightning, uh, uh, fraudulent, uh, I may say fraudulent lightning protection system and India seems to be worse. So be careful about that. And then generate income by providing consultancy, training, inspection, and certification services, design and implementation, and so on. Because these things will, uh, uh, will, will make a core income generation model for you. So if you need further details of how to conduct these training programs, uh, consultancies, and so on, we can have another uh, webinar later. And then I think I'm uh, running out of time. Uh, development of essentials. Th there are so many essentials you have to do when you're starting an LC. Uh, again, due to the lack of time, I'm not going into the details. Then website development, extremely important. Without having a website, you're nothing in the modern era. And then plan two to three major events per year. Uh, again, I have given you the list, not going one by one due to the time restriction. Then plan about 10 sub events per year. And these events make the driving force of existence uh, of the center. Uh, and then plan about two to three continuous activities per year. This is very important. This is what actually develop the confidence of the state sectors, banks, funding agencies regarding your LC. Uh, again, I will leave the list for you. If anybody wants, I can uh, pass this uh, presentation. And finally, prepare a gun chart for six months, one year, and three years. So make sure that you're working according to a time plan and plan that at the very beginning. And you should know that at any given time period of the, uh, the since you start the LC, where you are, what you have achieved, and what you have to achieve. And then this is my last slide, I think. Uh, once the core team finalized the roadmap and time plan, forward it to the head of the institution through proper channels. This is important. Then distribute it among the advisors. Then uh, try to stick. There are a few other important points. Try to stick as much as possible to your roadmap and time plan. Look for new opportunities. You priority to secure funding. Try to get good publicity for your group. Expand the horizons of your network and don't keep sleeping members in the exco. Very important. Remove them diplomatically. You don't need people just for the sake of having them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chandima, uh, for this uh, uh, guidance uh, for, to, to establish center and to run it uh, very smoothly. Thank you indeed. And if anybody has any questions uh, to establish the new centers, 
please uh, uh, leave questions on the chat box or contact Professor Chandima directly through the emails. He is very open and he can answer your uh, emails anytime he is free. Thank you indeed, Professor Chandima. Thank you very much, Sri. Now I would like to invite Professor Colin Price for his uh, uh, presentation. Uh, Price, are you ready with the presentation? Yes. Okay, very good. Professor Price is uh, the professor at uh, Tel Aviv University. Uh, you uh, have already heard about him yesterday as well. He has been working with the connection between global warming and future thunderstorm activity. The propagation of electromagnetic waves, low frequency ULF, ELF, ELF in the atmosphere, severe weather, including hurricanes, sprites, and other TLEs on Earth and uh, other planets, ULF precursors related to earthquakes, measurement of in infrasound in the atmosphere, space and space weather, and in the influence of solar storms on Earth the connections between biological system and electricity and he has received environmental environment and living foundation science award lsb uh, baden uh, Wurttemberg, and uh, uh, at Konstanz uh, university germany and uh, he has also uh, got the award for discovery uh, from Discovery Magazine as a top science story writer, ranked 25th out of 100. Elected to the Ele Executive Committee of International Commission on Electro Atmospheric Electricity, ICAE, in 2007. Uh, Professor Price uh, has been, was awarded Outstanding Referee Citation uh, from Geophysical Research Latest American Geophysical Union, 2008, elected to uh, Executive Council of the International Association of uh, Metrology and Atmospheric Science in 2011, and elected Associated Editor of Journal of Geophysical Research Atmospheres, 2012, and nominated as the Israeli representative of the International Union of Geodesy and Geophysics IUGG in 2014. I would like to invite uh, Professor Price uh, again and uh, give his uh, wonderful presentation. Please, Price. Thank, thank you, Sriram. Um, before I start, I'd like to send my condolences to the families of uh, all those injured and can killed in the last 24 hours in India and Nepal and in other regions a uh, real tragedy that has occurred just in the last 24 hours um, and uh, hopefully some of our work will be able to reduce these deaths and injuries in, in the future. Um, yesterday I spoke about uh, the trends in the past, what we think has happened in many places over the last hundred years um, based on both uh, data and also some proxy data using climate parameters and uh, various empirical models, since we don't have lightning and thunderstorm data going back uh, more than a few decades. Uh, and uh, today I'd like to talk about the future and what we can say about possible changes um, in lightning thunderstorm in the future. Before we start, I'd like to show this uh, diagram, <clears throat> which basically shows the problem we have um, where we're looking at the ris risk of disasters on the one side, we have the natural hazard, which we're, today we're talking about lightning, but this can be earthquakes, this can be uh, floods, uh, uh, tropical storms. And so in order we have to understand the, the hazard, the recurrence intervals, the future probability, which is what I want to speak about mainly today, the onset of these events, the magnitude, duration. Uh, but on the other side, we have the vulnerability of the population, um, the exposure, how, the size of the population, the economy will be very different in different countries, land use, infrastructure, cultural assets, um, and also the ability of countries to mitigate, prepare, respond, recover. 
And um, the, the overlap of these two circles gives us something about the risk of the disaster. So if we have no hazard, then we have no risk. Uh, and if we have no population, for example, the middle of the ocean, we have a tropical storm, um, which doesn't hit land, then we have also um, no risk. But uh, what I mentioned yesterday, and uh, we're hearing a lot about it today, is um, both of these seem to be increasing. The natural hazard, and I think there's evidence that thunderstorms and lightning activity is increasing over time. Uh, but also population is growing. People are becoming, populations and countries are becoming more vulnerable to these uh, hazards, especially lightning, as we saw in the last 24 hours in, in India and Nepal. And so it appears that the risk is going to be getting greater as a function of time. And even if climate change doesn't play a role, the risk is going to increase and the situation is going to get worse in the future. Um, and if climate change is having a role, it's going to get even worse because population is increasing especially in the developing world in the next uh, 50 to 100 years, uh, that's where most of the growth is going to occur. And so whichever way we look at it, the risk to lightning is going to increase in the future, and therefore our work is so important to reduce the deaths. And as uh, Mary mentioned, many more injuries, um, some of them are unseen injuries, the neurological system um, in the future. So what is predict projected for the future? Um, we don't really know. We, nobody knows what the future will bring, um, but many models have predicted that we, due to increasing greenhouse gases, we can expect a global warming of anywhere from maybe a two to four degrees by the end of the century. And if we don't do anything about the, the increase in greenhouse gases, then this will just continue in the next century. It's not gonna stop here. Um, and these different colored lines are different scenarios based on different, um, possibilities. If we're going at a more kind of business as usual and not doing much, or if we take uh, dramatic uh, reductions uh, or actions to reduce greenhouse gases by using renewable energies, the bottom line here is already irrelevant because it keeps the concentrations of greenhouse gases at a constant level at the year 2000. Well, that's already history. Um, and on the right, you can see actually the range of forecasts from various climate models. These are global models from around the world. And there are even models which claim it could be six degrees by the end of the century. And in fact, today there was just an article um, which I saw, I think, on the BBC that um, scientists think that all of these estimates may be actually an underestimation. So it may actually be worse than we, we see over here. But what does that mean already for thunderstorms and climate? Um, if we want to say something about what may happen by 2050, uh, we need to use climate models. We, this is what kind of our crystal ball. We have to look into the future. And us scientists, uh, climate, uh, atmospheric scientists, use these climate models, which are the most uh, computationally expensive uh, models in the world because we have to simulate the whole planet. We can't just sim simulate what may happen in India or Nepal because this is, the atmosphere has no boundaries. We have flow of greenhouse gases, winds, moisture from all locations, and they can uh, arrive in certain areas from many from far away. The tropics can uh, transport moisture, energy to higher latitudes. So we really need to do this kind of in a holistic, holistic uh, way. And this is extremely complicated. We need to divide the, the globe up into a grid. Uh, this is the first decision. How fine a grid do we want to find it? The spatial resolution, the, much, the longer it takes to do these simulations, more expensive when we talk about computational time. And in every single pixel, uh, every little box here, we need to solve all the different parameters and the, that we know about that exist at every place from the surface, which may have the oceans, may have uh, sea ice, uh, may have uh, land and vegetation covering it. Some of that vegetation may be covered by lakes or by snow. And then above that, we have the atmosphere, which has got clouds, uh, rainfall, absorption of solar radiation, aerosols, extremely complicated ocean currents and this has to be solved at every time step and at every location on the planet and then we have to keep doing this at every time iteration and therefore if we want to know what may happen in 2050 this can take us months literally months of our time to do one simulation and uh, if we want to change a parameter it'll take us another few months so this is a very complicated 
uh, job. And again, we are limited by the computational power and therefore limited also by the spatial resolution. And the problem with thunderstorms, um, thunderstorms and clouds is that often the processes that occur in thunderstorms and lightning occur at what we call the subgrid scale um, scale. So here you can see an example of one model uh, which is showing these grids, the spatial grids, and we also have to have layers in the atmosphere, which we have to decide what we want, how many layers we need there. We need layers also going to the oceans, which affect the, the flow of heat and momentum in the oceans. But thunderstorms often occur at the sub-grid scale size, and therefore we, it's very difficult to model thunderstorms and lightning, and we need parameterizations. And parameterizations are basically taking the model parameters that do exist. These are large scale parameters. So for example, in every box here, we'll have the average temperature, the average humidity, the average pressure, the average winds in the north, south, east direction. And we need to take those average parameters and somehow estimate what's happening on the subgrid scale size related to lightning. So this is very difficult and every group will have different ways of doing this. And I spent my PhD actually working on this problem, and uh, we developed some fairly simple um, relationships which relate the flash rate inside one of these grid boxes to the height, the, the, the height of the convective clouds. If we go back here, you can see there are different types of clouds in the model. We have to dif differentiate between cirrus clouds, stratus clouds, cumulus clouds, cumulonimbus, Again, how do we do this? So there, there are huge groups of scientists which have spent their whole life just working on clouds. And we, when we use just the convective clouds, we can estimate uh, at every time step what the height of the clouds are. And based on empirical data, either radar data or other data from satellite, we can uh, develop various relationships. And we develop two relationships, one for thunderstorms over the oceans and another one over the land, which have a simple relationship with the height of the cloud. And uh, physically, this is related to the updraft intensity in the clouds. Stronger the updrafts, the deeper the clouds. And we know that updrafts are also related to the charging in clouds and the, the amount of lightning. We also had a secondary uh, relationship, which actually can then split between how much lightning is in the cloud, how much is coming to the ground, based on the cold cloud thickness, which is how thick the cloud is from the zero, deg zero degree isotherm to the top of the cloud. This is a very simple relationship. And surprisingly, as you can see, this was published in 1992. So uh, we're talking about nearly 30 years ago. And still, climate models are using this relationship. There have been improvements, and there have been different ones. And I should point out recently, there was a different uh, calculation which shows different results to what I present here. But majority of the models are still using this simple relationship. And it seems to work fairly, fairly well in large-scale climate models. And to show that, we can see here, this is a, the a NASA climate model that I worked with. And here we can see on the right-hand side, the global distribution of lightning activity in June, July, August. So this is a climatology, not a specific year. June, July, August, and December, January, February. In June, July, August, most of the lightning in Northern Hemisphere above the continents and the opposite in the Southern Hemisphere, summer. And on the left, we have actual data for comparison this is from the satellite uh, OTD data, but this is for a single year, so June, July, August, 1995, and December, January, February, 1995, uh, 96. And uh, again, the, uh, I should point out the, the observations are not perfect because this is a, a low Earth orbit satellite, which is taking snapshots all the time. And so it's not seeing all the lightning, but nevertheless, when you collect enough data, we see a fairly good agreement between the actual observations and the model. The model is also far from perfect. Well, um, if we want to ask how thunderstorms may change in the future, we have to understand a bit about how thunderstorms form in the atmosphere. And in order for thunderstorms or convection to form, we need to have an unstable atmosphere. And what does that mean? Well, when air rises in the atmosphere, it cools because we have a decrease in pressure. And normally the air, if it's not saturated, will cool at what we call the dry adiabatic lapse rate, around about 10 degrees cooling for every kilometer we go up. When we reach saturation, which represents the base of the cloud when, when con condensation starts, then because of the release of latent heat, the cooling is actually at a lesser rate of around about six 
degrees per kilometer. So this is the theoretical rate that things should cool when you, when you rise with a parcel of air. Now this has to be compared always to the environmental real uh, uh, value which we measure sending up a, a balloon or a radius on every day in, from many meteorological stations around the globe. And an unstable atmosphere implies that the, the slope of this curve of the environmental lapse rate is always greater than these two. And what happens is as the air rises, it has to cool by the theoretical uh, cooling rate, and we compare that to the environmental rate. And if we look as we go higher and higher, the air parcel is gonna be also much warmer than the environment, less dense, and it will keep on rising and will form a thunderstorm. The larger the differences between the, the theoretical lapse rate and the environmental one, the more intense the thunderstorms will be, the stronger the updraft, the more electrification, and the more lightning. So when we talk about climate change and global warming in the future, it's not only important what happens here uh, to the surface temperature, it's also important what happens to the lapse rate in the atmosphere. So if this is, say, the dry adiabatic lapse rate, the theoretical one, if we now warm the temperatures through global warming, we could have a situation where it warms the same amount at every, uh, every altitude. This is a Z, the vertical axis altitude, and this is temperature. If we warm at the surface and up aloft the same amount, the slope doesn't change, and there should be no change in lightning activity and convection. In other, on the other hand, if we warm it more at the surface than we do at uh, aloft, Again, we're looking at the slope. This is a steeper slope. Then in this case, we should have more thunderstorms because we have a more unstable atmosphere. And the last option is having a warming at the surface, but more warming aloft. And then this becomes a stabilization of the atmosphere, maybe less thunderstorms. Well, uh, what's predicted for the future? Well, based on the models, and again, we don't have any idea if this is correct or not, but the models, show here that if we look at the warming from 2011 to 2030, 2046 to 65, 2080 to 99, and this is latitude given from the North Pole to the South Pole, and the vertical axis is pressure or altitude, the largest warming is actually in the tropics, but in the upper atmosphere around about 200 millibars, which is around 10 kilometers. And so this actually implies that the upper tropical atmosphere is going to warm more than the surface, and this, we would think, would maybe result in less thunderstorms, a more stable atmosphere. But when we run the models, surprise, surprise, we see that actually when the models show that by 2100, we have up to a 40% increase in thunderstorms in the model. And there are different models which have been run. And for approximately a one degree warming, we see about a 10% increase in global lightning. Uh, this appears to be a paradox. The atmosphere is getting more stable but we're actually seeing more lightning. Well, I can tell you that, I don't have time now to show it, but if you, if you look in the literature, there are examples where this happens today. For example, during the El Nino. The El Nino results in dry conditions in Southeast Asia, over Indonesia, uh, Philippines, North Australia, drought conditions, in fact, and a lot of fires and air pollution. But when you look at the lightning data, we actually have more lightning when we have the El Nino over Southeast Asia. How do we explain this? Well, we think that there are actually less thunderstorms which are happening in the drier climate, but when they do occur, they're much more explosive and they can produce a lot more lightning. Another model here, another NASA run of this model showing in the, in the model a 3.8 degree warming by the end of the century. And here we can see the changes, the increases in lightning activity. I wouldn't give too much, uh, I wouldn't, uh, I don't think the actual regional distribution uh, should be trusted that much, but overall we can see about a 50% increase in lightning activity over the century. Um, I should point out that another recent, as I mentioned before, another recent model uh, which used a different parameterization shows actually a decrease in lightning in the future, but when they use our parameterization that we use, they also see an increase. And so the models are fairly sensitive of what parameterization you use. And I think this, we're still not certain exactly um, how much lightning will in, uh, increase in the future. Um, this is an inter interesting plot I found from 2005, which shows actually the number of insurance claims. This is in the United States. 
the number of insurance claims as a function of temperature. And we can see that as temperatures get warmer, we have more and more lightning related uh, insurance losses. And this is also a factor which shows there's a link between increasing temperatures, more thunderstorms, more lightning, and more damage. I'd just like to end to say that the story gets even more complicated when we look at aerosols. Aerosols are those small little particles which are in the atmosphere, which also are used for cloud condensation nuclei, CCN, as well as ice nuclei in clouds. Every droplet in the atmosphere, in every cloud, has a little nuclei in the center of it. And if the atmosphere was completely clean of, of aerosols, we would have no clouds. Clouds, droplets cannot form from pure water. They have to form only on, they can only form on CCN. And so these aerosols are very important for cloud microphysics. But when we change the amount of aerosols due to air pollution, we change actually the microphysics of clouds. And with increased air pollution, growing populations, we can also expect more pollution in the future. And what happens is when we have a clean atmosphere on the left here compared with the polluted atmosphere, there's more competition for the water by the aerosols. And so in a clean atmosphere, we have say 300 uh, aerosols per cc. And each drop, each uh, aerosol can collect a lot of water, grows very quickly and will fall out as what we call warm rain uh, fairly quickly. And we can have a fairly efficient rain production, but we have fewer droplets, but they're bigger. When we have more aerosols and more pollution, there's a lot more competition for, for the water. So we have many more droplets, but they're a lot smaller. And if they're smaller, they're lighter, and they can actually be taken up higher into the cloud above the freezing level where they can freeze. They release a lot of latent heat and can result in more buoyancy of the cloud. And these clouds can actually be much deeper and can have a lot more lightning activity. And so more aerosols can actually result in an invigoration of the storms and produce more lightning. But, and that's a, a big but, we did a, a study back in 2010, was published, to see how aerosols actually impact lightning. And we looked at the aerosols actually from biomass burning in the Amazon. This white box is where we studied the lightning activity and the color scale shows you the, the smoke from the, the fires. And we looked over these four years and we saw that when we have very clean conditions, and this, this x-axis is called the aerosol optical depth. It's a satellite measurement of how many aerosols we have in the atmosphere. When it's a very clean atmosphere and we add some of these aerosols, we see that this does have a, a positive impact on the lightning. We have an increase in the lightning activity uh, due to this effect of competition before the water and smaller droplets, they go up higher in the cloud, they freeze, more re release in latent heat, more uh, electrification. But when we pass a certain threshold of about 0 0.25 and we have too much aerosols, we have this boomerang effect and we actually see a decrease in lightning activity. And the reason we think we have this decrease is that basically when we have lots of smoke, and he has a picture above the Amazon, when we have lots of smoke, we actually, the smoke itself will absorb some of the solar radiation. And where we have the smoke, we actually have a warming because of the solar radiation heating that layer, and it blocks that radiation from hitting the surface. So we actually, if this was the normal uh, adiabatic lapse rate, we actually have a stabilizing of the atmosphere in the lower atmosphere until we pass the smoke, and then things go back to normal. And so when we have too many aerosols, we can actually choke the thunderstorms and pre uh, prevent the thunderstorms developing. And so when we talk about the future, and I'll end here, when we're talking about the future of thunderstorms, we need to look at both temperature changes, lapse rate changes, aerosol changes, and maybe others as well. And I think the jury is still out of what's actually going to happen in the future as a result of climate change. And, and I th think this is an important area to study because again, this is going to impact the risk of populations in different places, especially in the developing world. So I'll thank you and I'll end there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Berlin, uh, for your wonderful and very, very informative, and of course, uh, threatening presentation. Are you threatening us, Professor Colleen? No, but I'm telling you, you need to pay attention
attention and beware that things may get worse than they are today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you indeed. And I hope uh, everybody uh, uh, got it very, very carefully. And uh, uh, thank you again for your wonderful presentation. We can share anything from Professor Colin. He is very open and uh, we can uh, get his uh, knowledge uh, through the emails as well. Thank you indeed. Now I would like to well, invite uh, uh, Dr. Devapriya Dutta from India. Uh, uh, Dr. Devapriya, are you there? Dr. Devapriya? Are you there? Uh, yeah, 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 I'm here. It was muted, so you can't hear. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I think I cannot, because, you know, I you cannot see me because uh, host had stopped it. It says that you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. So you cannot see me. That's the reason, yeah. You can share your screen instead uh, if you have a presentation with you. Okay. Uh, yeah, Dr. Okay. Devapri yeah. uh, uh, completed his PhD from the Indian Agricultural Research Institute. New Delhi and joined the National Agricultural Research Service of the Indian Council of Agricultural Research, ICA. He served as a scientist in the Central Soil and Water Conservation Research and Training Institute, Dehradun, and he joined the Natural uh, Resources Data Management System, NRDMS, a division of the Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, in 1994 as a senior scientific officer one and was uh, in the same department as a scientist F director till May 2008. Thereafter, he was appointed as the Council of Science and Technology in the Embassy of India, Washington DC during 2008 to 12. At this, uh, at this responsibility, he handled uh, the India and USA science and technology cooperation policy projects and program levels in the sectors of health, energy, climate, and environment, and education. During September 2012 to 15, he assumed the responsibility of director, Indo-French Center for the Promotion of Advanced Research, a bilateral organization to promote collaborative research between India and France in cutting edge science and technology. Currently, he is serving as a head of head and advisor scientist G in the science for equity uh, empowerment and development seed state uh, science and technology program SSTP and natural resource data management system and our DMS divisions of the Department of Science and Technology Government of India. Do, uh, Dr. Dutta, could you please start your presentation? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. And thank you to all uh, colleagues. And uh, it's good evening. I will just, you know, the go through the uh, the India's technological readiness for the lightning risk reductions, but though you see that you know yesterday, uh, like uh, like uh, the, so I think that uh, my RDS speaker has already uh, you know uh, conveyed our grief for the you know the unfortunate event which happened in the India in Bihar and Bhopal, and. Uh, Yeah, so you see that the, uh, you know, it shows that it doesn't need any uh, like, you know, evidence, but it shows over time that in comparisons to the other, uh, you know, the natural disasters, the lightning is becoming in serious, uh, you know, the natural disasters in India. Uh, this is the average annual frequency of the thunderstorms in India over, uh, like, and as you see here, it's over uh, two decades, it has been shown. And this shows that the average number of the thunders and the lightning days and relative has its uh, priorities. That as you see here, like, you know, it shows a pattern that it's in, uh, you know, concentrated in certain parts of, uh, you know, India, the reasons we'll see. As far as the, you know, the study of uh, the lightning is concerned, the Indian Institute of Tropical uh, Meteorology in Pune uh, under Ministry of Earth Science, they have uh, in the lightning de detections networks, like which is in the lightning sensors, earth networks, lightning sensors, which is, uh, you know, the types of the lightning it detects is the cloud to ground and in ground, in cloud, uh, the strokes, the center radio frequency bandwidth is one hertz to 12 meter hertz. Location accuracy in Southwest India is around less than 100 meters, it, it, again, de uh, de density dependent. 
and detection efficiency is more than 95 uh, you know the percent so that again it's a uh, you know the depend it disaster depend now from the coming from the government side the national disaster Ma management authority which is under the ministry of home affairs uh, they have an you know the guidelines for the a of action plans like how they do uh, either manage the thunderstorms and the lightning uh, and strong winds and this shows that you know, over like the lightning over the years and the last like the 45 years is becoming a major uh, disaster in, in india so if we look into the ndma or the national disaster management authorities guidelines in 2018 it established its qualitative and effective early warning system intelligence coordination communications it develops advanced preparedness mitigations response plan preparedness at the local level for an effective incidence response plan public it creates public awareness and community outreach of which is one of the issues also this network is looking for collaborations with the non-government organization civil society assessing the impact getting feedback for reviewing and updating the plan so as you know that lightning i, I like and i shouldn't say like how it happens but just to inform you that the lightning is notified as a state specific disaster in india and especially lightning starts in the in the, in the, monsoon, the pre monsoon seasons mostly in maharashtra orissa uttar pradesh andhra pradesh jharkhand and bihar in uh, in india so uh, in, like while uh, basically uh, investigating the reasons for the increased lightning there are a number of studies within india as well as from the nasa the university of california berkeley and elsewhere have suggested rising global temperature might trigger like as you've seen as i'm um, uh, like uh, from the other uh, speaker earlier the study by the indian institute of tropical meteorology showed that the western state of maharashtra states like orissa bihar jharkhand kerala and andhra pradesh has been particularly hard hit by a rise in the number of lightning start and this may be the, the, the increasing the uh, you know the uh, the temperatures uh, if you see in the month wise the li lightning facilities mostly takes place as you see during this the uh, the monsoon period during the maximum during this june july and uh, the uh, uh, the affected people gender wise is mostly the uh, the male and the uh, the females <coughs> are uh, you know the uh, 5 to 6 percent are the females and the, uh, the, the child children so the few more facts about uh, the lightning facilities uh, uh, facilities is the generally lightning strikes in the second half of the day it's everywhere there the more than 95 percent casualties are in the rural area maximum casualties are due to people standing under a tall tree water bodies like dam pond are highly vulnerable and farmers are the most vulnerable uh, in the rural areas so there is a weather early warning source like you know, this is from the imd like in the in input comes from the national remote sensing organization the department of space and the other in, uh, international meteorological organizations and even some of the private players who are operating now in uh, india like sky, sky met so the lightning warning system it's basically uh, like as you know that why lightning takes place but yeah, it's due to the electromagnetic changes in the sky and depends on the number of the spatial factors already you have seen. This is a change is a dynamic and controlled but can be tracked. So in order to uh, do the early um, warning system, these are the options, the Doppler, Baltic, and the Earth, no, uh, Earth network sensors. Based of the observations of the lightning monitoring network on time warning is issued to the footer, SMS, EML, TV, uh, FM radio, mass media, and the agromet advisories. There are certain apps are also available, so it gives the updated water in, uh, weather information, 10 days weather forecast, including the chances of rains and storms, uh, and hour wise, uh, and also 30 minutes to three hours advanced warning systems. So people are directed to save grids or the shelters. Now, in uh, this early warning systems has been, uh, you know, the the experimented in some of these states in India. One of them is in Jharkhand, where there is a lightning, uh, lightning uh, warning and the zone mapping projects there. The seven senses so deployed for the early warning. This is uh, basically a collaborative project between the Birla Institute of Technology, Mesra, and the NASA. And lightning <coughs> event in LEC event occurred. It's as you can see here. There's the list that 50 and highest is in LEC 446. And these are the voltages of the lightning. The list is 50 kilowatt and highest is a 2000 kilowatt. There is a village named Bajram, Bajar Mara, which already lost of 15 to 20 uh, lives in, you know, in uh, Jharkhand, which is a state uh, near, near Bihar, and the level one 15 districts and the level two uh, like there are nine districts in uh, Jharkhand, like which according to their 
uh, vulnerability. So these are the lightning detection centers, which has been uh, you know, the established. There is another initiatives in Andhra Pradesh, where the Andhra Pradesh Disaster Management Department has set up a multi-hazards warning systems. And <clears throat> AP state councils of the higher education in partnerships with Earth Networks USA deployed severe weather early, uh, early warning now casting system based on the total lightning detection techniques. And there's a lightning action plan has been prepared by the state and they're maintaining the sensor supplied by the earth networks and is developing various dissemination means including development app as you see here there is a central uh, uh you know the the monitoring uh, center has been established there is a lightning safe grid has been uh, you know the established like in the again in charkhand this uh, lightning arresters are uh, basically you all of you know that these are the uh, which arrests the lightning before it's formed and hence there is no sound and light. So based on the expected intensity of the lightning, the lightning arresters are installed in series to make the lightning safe. So these are uh, the places where in the Ranchi, which is in Jharkhand, this has been established. So uh, as a result of that, uh, it shows that these early warnings are, are the most advantageous in design. With increase in acute climate activity, lightning more frequent and the more better. The capacity building programs for training and awareness is effective. It should have been focused approach, safe grid, uh, you know, in landmark success and decrease in casualties and economic losses due to lightning. Uh, so there's a, another pilot project in, in the Jharkhand on monitoring lightning and thunderstorms. Objective is to delineate the Jharkhand state in terms of the frequency, intensity and severity of the lightning incidences for prioritized adoptions of the safety measures. So there the different uh, detection centers in seven places, as you see, uh, see that they're uh, detected and the data is regularly being collected for that. So these are the, uh, according to the data collected, the Jharkhands are divided into this lively uh, level one and the level two, like the level one is 15 districts and level two are nine districts. These are the districts there in Jharkhand. So ultimately out of this, uh, you know, the, uh, experience of India, the recommendations is that the early warning system should be strengthened and the dissemination it should be made mandatory to reduce losses. Uh, Earth Network's focus is in advanced and more cost effective. Lightning action plan should be adopted by uh, you know each of the states and 95% per, uh, fatalities in the rural areas, people in open fields standing under tall trees, so there should be an awareness about this. Lightning zone mapping uh, may not be sacro scan, but regular monitoring evaluations review must be done and lightning arresters, best safe grids are relatively most safe and should be promoted. So this is overall in uh, you know, the shot that this is the India's experience of this uh, you know, readiness of the lightning and which needs, uh, which is getting updated also with the uh, recent technology. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Thank so you much, Dr. Shama. Uh, for your uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, one query, uh, what kind of uh, lightning arrester have you been installing in this area? Uh, any idea about the... Uh, yeah, this uh, lightning arrester, I, what kind of... I have to find it out, like an I... Is this the... Okay. Yeah, the, this is the left thing. Uh -huh. I, I again I can give you the details uh, later on, Dr. Rama. Okay, okay. Yeah, I think uh, many people will be uh, questioning on these things. So we will we'll discuss about it uh, later on as well. Sure. Any question? Uh, I think uh, uh, Mr. Gopakumar may uh, raise some question on this. Uh, do you have any question at the moment, or we'll discuss later on, Mr. Gopakumar? <laughs> I can't, I can't hear anything. Okay, okay, we'll discuss it later on. We'll take it uh, later on. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dutta. Uh, despite your busy schedule, you uh, yeah. uh, came and presented uh, your uh, experience and uh, your work. Thank you indeed for being with us. Uh, and uh, we'll uh, go together in the days ahead because uh, Solnet is sure. working in the region. Uh, in promoting the lightning safety awareness campaign and uh, to, to uh, have a scientific lightning protection system in the region. No, uh, no. So we work together and we look forward to work together with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, before I move on to next uh, uh, presenter, 
I would like to show a small video on on the lightning lightning safety week. Uh, Sri Yog, are you there? Can you show the video, please? Okay. You have to okay. Unmute. Just a second, I'll start the video. You share the video. Is it visible? Yes, it is. Yes. Go for it. Yes, it is. Hello, I'm John Jensenius, a lightning safety specialist with the National Lightning Safety Council. June 28th is International Lightning Safety Day. It's a day to not only call attention to the dangers of lightning, but also to draw attention to some of the problems lightning safety and protection around the world. Every year there are about 5,000 documented lightning deaths in countries around the world. However, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Many deaths in developing countries go unreported. It's estimated that the actual number of lightning deaths is about 20,000 worldwide. Why such a large number? The problem is that many people in developing countries don't have a safe place to go to in a thunderstorm. In rural areas of developing countries, churches, schools, and homes don't have wiring or plumbing and therefore don't provide any protection. It's not unusual to see a large number of people killed in a home or a church, or unfortunately, a large number of children killed at a school. The good news is that countries around the world are starting to coordinate their efforts on International Lightning Safety Day. If you'd like to learn more about International Lightning Safety Day, please visit our website at lightningsafetycouncil.org. Thank you. Uh, that's it with the video. I'll stop the sharing now. Okay, thank you so much, Ryog, and thank you so much, John, for this nice video, although it uh, came a little bit uh, slow. Well, it was wonderful. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, John, you are there, I think. Uh, would you like to say anything uh, regarding this video or some other information, John? Yeah, I, I just, uh, first of all, I, you know, it's one of those things that, uh, uh, and Marianne had uh, mentioned this, is that uh, we're trying to use all the technologies we can uh, certainly your problems are quite different than ours where people can get to a safe place. Our problem is really uh, encouraging people to get to that safe place. You're, you have the problem of, uh, a lot of you have the problem of just simply uh, uh, there is no safe place and what can you do. So uh, this video was really just to educate some of the people in our country with some of the problems that all of you are having. and. I certainly appreciate all the presentations that everyone has given today. Okay, John, thank you so much for your efforts and uh, kind words. Thank you indeed. Thank you. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Uh, Anil Pokrel, uh, the Chief Executive of uh, Disaster and uh, Risk Reduction Management Authority in Nepal. Uh, I think Mr. Pokrel, you are there. Mr. Anil Pokhrel, are you there? Yes, yes, Shriam, sir. Namaste, namaste, everyone. Thank you so much Am for joining me tonight. Uh, Mr. Pokhrel is the Chief Executive of National Disaster Risk Reduction Management Authority, Government of Nepal. He is a very energetic and a dynamic person, uh, uh, having a research uh, associate in the Risk and Resilience Program. He has worked on a disaster risk management and climate change adaptation programs, has investigated multi-hazard risk factors and 
provides policy and technical support has a master's degree in environmental management and bachelor's degree in civil engineering. Worked with a World Bank, uh, GFDRR, Asian Development Bank, and ISET, International Nepal. He worked on multiple projects uh, and technical assistance on disaster risk reduction and management and climate change uh, in multiple countries in Southeast, South Asia. Uh, East Asia and Central and West Asia. Uh, I I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Pokhrel in the meeting. Uh, thank you for thanking thank you thank you so much for being with us. Uh, thank you thank you so much, Sir. Uh, let let me let me did you try sharing my uh, slides? So, so once again, thank you so much for the organizing committee and, and particularly to, to Dr. Sriram sir uh, for organizing this, this event and for, uh, for giving me this opportunity to, to, to speak for the next 15 minutes. Uh, thank you so much. I've been, I've been really able to kind of benefit from the presentations that I have been able to hear just this evening. Uh, let, me, let me take this opportunity to quickly share where we are in terms of understanding lightning risks in Nepal and, and what are our immediate and longer term uh, action plans for addressing this, this, this lightning risk. Uh, on this outset, I'd like to, to state by beginning by saying that the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Authority has been very recently set up. It's only been six months uh, ever since I was appointed and uh, However, this, the act for the National Disaster Risk Reduction, for setting up the National Disaster Risk Reduction Management Authority was endorsed by the parliament in 2074. Um, sorry, in 2074 become some, but uh, this is, uh, and so uh, what we've been able to do is, is in the last six months, able to set up our office, get in a few, few of our uh, staff um, and, and starting out an action plan for what we could do on an immediate term and a longer term period. While doing so, we've, we've come, across, uh, um, come across many institutions and individuals uh, where we've been started working on collaborating on, on multiple hazards, and one of which is lightning. I'd like to quickly again use this opportunity to, to, to quickly share my outline. What, what I'm going to say today is basically kind of like to walk you through, uh, through what, are the, what are the key risks and particularly what, what, what are the big numbers in terms of lightning, uh, lightning risks. Uh, this, is, this is not something new, especially given, given the engagement Dr. Dr. Sarma has with this community uh, and in particularly in Nepal. Uh, and then I'd, I'd like to quickly kind of go into some of those quick challenges, especially around limited awareness and risk information. Manbadarji has also kind of like highlighted this on, uh, on the limited awareness and risk information. And then um, the capacity gaps issues. I'd like to end by again what are our immediate actions um, for a short term period and for longer term plans. Uh, I have two small like awareness messages that we've been able to design and air in the last uh, last three four months. I'd also want to I'd like to end by sharing some of those those quick messages that we've been we've been drawing. So, <clears throat> in terms of the risks, what I wanted to do is. Uh, and share this plot for the deaths that has occurred in the last 365 days. Uh, our, one of our colleagues, Mr. Pradeep Khatiwada, he, he must be here as a part of the audience right now. He helped us generate this earlier this afternoon. Uh, the purpose that I'm showing here uh, is, is, again, nothing is something new, new to this audience, but I want to highlight by saying that, again, Nepal is at a hot spot. Uh, and, and in the last 365 days, there's been 85 dates, uh, 356 incidents. We, we took this the same image to look at what happened during the last uh, Nepali calendar year. Uh, the numbers do not change much, but and also the plots do not change much. Uh, so close to around like 100 deaths every year. That's what we experience it. Uh, and if we see the number of incidents and the deaths, um, 
disaggregated by our, our provinces. We have seven provinces and it, it's evident that it's, it's province number one and province number two that are at, at most highest risk, followed by province number five and, and other provinces. Over the last uh, close to 10 years, we've, we've seen around 2,053 incidents and close to 1,000 deaths. Uh, the number of, uh, uh, again, cattle and other infrastructure destroyed is, uh, is astounding. The data system doesn't really uh, do enough justice to, to capture the, uh, the details of the infrastructure destroyed, and particularly the livestock uh, uh, that have been impacted, and particularly that have died. Uh, Dr. Sarma has, um, has showed us uh, like numerous pictures and, case, and shared us numerous case studies where where hordes of sheep and a lot of cattle have been have been killed uh, in, in even in a single incidence. Um, so just to kind of walk you through the the incidents over the last uh, last ten years, uh, there's a there's a sudden spike in 2076, uh, like two years back, uh, and but on an average, it's it's something around like um, it's it. Uh, it's more easily reflected in the number of injured and the number of uh, of deaths. Uh, number of deaths is is again something around like 100, and 100 people every year. In the last 10 years, the highest number is 131. Um, and <clears throat> we've also in the last uh, three months we've seen already like close to 40 deaths. And so this is this is what the the trends in terms of annual deaths uh, look like. Again. Uh, Again, this is this is perhaps to this audience nothing new, but but in terms of uh, in terms of the kind of work that we we've been doing, uh, and and in terms of understanding, it's it's pretty much uh, we in, in its very initial stages. This, as as Manji say, earlier said, like again, there's very been been very limited awareness about this particular issue. There's only limited number of only a handful number of programs that are actually kind of addressing this particular risk. This is one image that I wanted to show you about. Uh, the, the lightning detection uh, system that we have currently within uh, within Nepal. This is a, a screenshot uh, generated by by one of our observation systems that's managed by the Department of Hydrology and Metrology. Um, I, I could sense that there was a presentation earlier yesterday regarding the now casting work that could be done for for landslide um, alerts and landslide sorry um, uh, uh, lightning related uh, alerts. Uh, and now casting. <clears throat> so this is this is a potential that we we're further exploring. Uh, fortunately, with the support of the World Bank, we've been able to set up nine uh, lightning detection centers. There's also one more station sta uh, uh, managed by the National Academy of Science and Technology. So in total, around like ten stations that could be used to produce now casting. So, <clears throat> so I'd like to now come to uh, what are what are we what are we within the NDRMA doing in terms of short term, what are immediate, immediate term and longer term plans? So in terms of our work within the last six months, we've been focusing mostly in terms of understanding lightning risks. Uh, we've had had a couple of rounds of discussions and, and thanks to Dr. Sarma, he's been able to kind of like walk us through, uh, through the work that, uh, that he has done and his institute and the engagement within, within the broader the lightning global lightning community that he's been able to engage with and 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 that he's hosted a couple of number of like global seminars here in nepal uh, so using all this information we we started on a uh, on a campaign to to basically kind of build awareness within the general masses um, and mostly through through media uh, we we've been able to kind of produce some of the jingles and, and awareness materials uh, using some of these materials in terms of building capacities um, and, and particularly in in the last last couple of months, uh, we've been able to identify and and define our collaborating partners. Uh, it's mostly through uh, through the uh, a joint actions between between the government agencies, uh, the private sector, uh, the research institutes, and and our donors and development partners. Uh, one of our key partners has been the Ministry of Energy, Irrigation, and Water Resources. They are but both the generators of, of uh, the risk information, but also one of those key sectors that are that's impacted, apart from from the deaths of individual families and individual individual people, uh, 
the Ministry of Energy <coughs> uh, experiences large, substantial amount of like damages in terms of their transmission lines, in terms of their power projects. Uh, they also uh, are the line agency for the Department of Hydrology and Metallurgy. Same agency, the same agency that does the, the lightning observations. Uh, for some reason, I, for some reason, okay. So uh, the partners again within the government is the National Academ Academy of Science and Technology. They also do run one of the one um, observation centers. Uh, our other partners are universities and research institutes. There have been partners, NGOs and INGOs, including the private sector. And so building on those experiences for, for, and, and the lessons that we've learned over the last, uh, last couple of months, uh, jointly with, uh, with Dr. Sarma's help, we've been working on, on charting out uh, an action plan that defines shorter term, immediate term and, and long-term action plans. This is still a work in progress. As I, I said earlier, uh, there's, there's some mixed progress in terms of the lightning warning, the la lightning now cast uh, system that we, we have. In addition to those 10 stations, uh, the government has, has now uh, installed uh, a Doppler radar in, in, the, in the western region of the country. It, in, in this upcoming fiscal year, it also intends to add two more Doppler radars within the country that with all these three radars and this array of, of 10 detection centers, we should be able to kind of cover uh, most of the country in terms of observing uh, your lightning risks uh, and, and produce, it, produce now casting. Uh, our ongoing work is, is also that's happening is on, on developing a code for, for lightning. Uh, Dr. Sarma is also part of, part of that process. It's been led by the Ministry of Urban Development, um, particularly the Department of Urban Development and Building Construction. Uh, we also, working closely with the Ministry of Energy and Irrigation and Water Resources, mainly looking at uh, assessing the past damages in terms of uh, the structures, particularly the energy, energy infrastructures um, and communications, um, communication systems have occurred in the last, uh, in the last recent years. Uh, this, has been, this has been now a priority of the Ministry of Energy itself. Uh, Using all these uh, messages and the media information, our, our whole focus has been to build awareness uh, at all levels um, and continue engaging with, with other partners such as with ADPC and others in terms of building capacities uh, for, for addressing this particular risk. Uh, again, we, wanna <clears throat> we would want to benefit from the, mass, the, the vast amount of research that's been undertaken by this community. A, and through academic institutions and universities, this, this we understand that this has to be an ongoing, ongoing work. Uh, and we also would like to, again, uh, support the preparation of, of actionable decision, decisions for reducing lighting risk at municipal level for some of those hotspot districts and municipalities in, 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 this, in this upcoming fiscal year. Uh, with all this, uh, in, in the five years, uh, what we'd want to do is to, to do a substantial reduction in the loss and life of property from, from lightning risks. This is how we, again, uh, this is a work in progress, and we'd want to come up with a five-year action plan uh, coinciding with, with my tenure. Um, my tenure is, is for five years at the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Authority, so, so I've been asked by, by our ministry to prepare a five-year action plan for, for, for every hazards, and this is how we, we're taking it forward. So uh, with this, I'd like to take this again as an, as an opportunity to share some of our, uh, just a couple of our uh, uh, work on, on uh, building awareness, mainly through jingles and um, Hello, uh, Mr. Pogrel. I think your voice is stuck and presentation is also stuck. 
So uh, let us thank uh, Mr. Pohil for his presentation uh, because we are almost running short of uh, time. So uh, maybe, uh, Mr. Pohil, are you there? It's uh, very sure. difficult to hear you. Um, sorry, what, was it audible? Was it visible? Uh, it was not moving. It was not audible. Now it is audible. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry for that. Um, so I, I'll, I'll stop here. Um, so I, I had one more, one more uh, social me the messages to that we had produced. So I'll, but I'll, I'll stop here. I'll, I'll not uh, say this. So, so I in my presentation here, and I'd be, I'd be happy to kind of like again uh, answer any questions if if I have a chance. Um, Thank you so much once again. Uh, over to you all, Dr. Server. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Anil, for your uh, nice presentation and uh, very, very enthusiastic initiatives uh, that you have taken uh, under this uh, project. Um, thank you indeed. And uh, I, I don't know if you are aware that uh, we are going to mark uh, uh, the day after tomorrow, uh, the 20th of uh, June, as uh, like International Lightning Safety Day. Do you have any plan on how to mark uh, the day, uh, Mr. Uh, Pokhrel? I think your, your, your voice is again inaudible. Hello. Yeah. Am I audible now? Yes, yes, now you are audible. So what we've done is, again, we've, uh, we've sent letters, uh, particularly to, to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, asking them to route this letter, uh, letter to, to, again, to the UNESCO offices uh, and to other relevant agencies within Nepal for, uh, in, this, in this regard. Uh, we uh, we've, we've not been able to, again, given our very initial months uh, in terms of establishing the office itself, uh, there's, there's no definite plans as such. But what we could do is, given the incidences that has happened over the last few days and the recent events that has happened in India, there's been a serious concern um, by, by, by our ministry, including, uh, including the, the high-level political circles. Uh, so what we could do is we could act as like, again, uh, Try getting a message out from from the minister himself, uh, and and do a couple of social messages uh, through our social me social uh, media handles on on that particular date. Uh, I know there's there's very limited time time between today and uh, the international lightning safety day, uh, but we could we could explore what what else could be done on that particular day. Shall shall we have a, a media conference or something like that, or webinar on on that particular day, so that it can be circulated among the society? Uh, 26, 27, 28 is a Sunday. We, we we could do we could do we could do that absolutely. Yeah, I think we should plan for that. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your for your acceptance. Uh, we look forward to that. Uh, I think uh, we don't have much questions uh, uh, from the participants and uh, uh, may maybe many people are feeling sleepy too. Uh, uh, and I would like to conclude by saying that uh, let everybody from among the participants uh, try to mark this uh, International Lightning Safety Day from our disposal. Uh, as much as possible to raise the awareness among the societies, uh, people, and uh, you know communities, uh, uh, particularly working in the field of uh, uh, um, uh, risk reduction and uh, uh, humanitarian organization. Let us try to bring uh, many of them into the uh, group and then mark 20th of uh, June as International Lightning Safety Day. Uh, by saying so, I would like to conclude from my part, and I would like to thank everybody to be here, being a part of uh, this meeting. Uh, special thanks to Professor Gomez and uh, Professor Marian Cooper for their tireless efforts to make it happen from their part. 
Uh, uh, Chandima, would you like to share something at the end? And uh, Marianne, would you like to share something? Uh, just, just a small uh, uh, message to everybody. Now, this uh, Lightning Safety Day uh, is uh, one of the most important outcomes of all our efforts for the last uh, 10, 15 years. Uh, I think uh, at least 10 of the people who attended this meeting had a great contribution towards uh, the implementation of the, or, or, or coming up with the idea of the International Lightning Safety Day. It, it, it does not came overnight. It, it's a result of many years of the work that all of us have done. Uh, over the years. So I would like to ask everybody to see whatever the way that you can contribute to make this day a success. When I say the day a success, I mean if you can give something to the society so that at least one injury, one life, one property damage could be avoided in the next year due to your efforts. It's wonderful. So therefore, please see how you can contribute to this uh, important day or important occasion. Uh, and I, I wish you all the very best and uh, courage for taking this uh, International Lightning Safety Day forward. Thank you. Professor Marianne, uh, would you like to share something? Then? Thank you, Sri. Um, I'd like to say that I'd like to echo what Chandima is saying. We all have our plans of what we'd like to accomplish, but it always <laughs> seems to go slower than we think. Uh, Chandima and I, we won't even tell you how many years we've been working at this because it will show our age. But um, and it's so wonderful to finally see it blooming. Sometimes you have to teach a whole generation or wait for a generation to go by before you can inspire the new people coming through. Um, I wanna say, so be patient. On the other hand, take full advantage of crises. I don't wanna celebrate the death of these seven people in Nepal at all. I'm, I'm so sorry for their families, but take advantage of it, just like you are already planning to do with your press conference. That's wonderful. Uh, you can really, when it's at the top of the government's worries, that's when you need to strike. Sometimes it'll work, sometimes it won't, but, but take advantage of crises. Um, and one of the th another thing is I'd like you to all remember, we're part of a team now. We're all here to help each other. Everyone has their unique talents, their unique uh, contributions they can make. Uh, so don't feel you have to be an expert in all the pieces. Uh, contribute what you can and work with the rest of us and work with the rest of your associates in your countries to do the best you can to build a good foundation. And um, last but not least, I'd really like this to be the first step, just like the U.S. has been uh, doing lightning safety for 20 years. Let's make this the first step to all of us contributing to lightning safety, injury prevention, property damage uh, reduction, and those pieces of lightning danger uh, over the next 20 years or more. Maybe we'll have solved the problem in 20 years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Marian. And uh, I think we will uh, receive all the presentations through YouTube uh, links. Uh, isn't it? Uh, Dale is working on that. Is Dale there? Hi. Hello. Me? Thank you so much for your efforts, Dale. Uh, thank you. So I just want to uh, say to everyone, if you want to share your slides, please send it to me and I'll make a Google share folder. So, um, and then uh, Jerem can send it, the link to everybody so everybody can um, download the slides.
Um, and the videos will be uploaded. Um, I'm, I'm trying to upload it um, uh, over the weekend, but once it's done, um, you can watch it on, on YouTube. Thank and you. there is an educational booklet. Um, the link is through, uh, I sent it the link through the chat. So um, I'll also have it uh, available on the YouTube channel so you can um, look at it. That's it, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, is there any question, any uh, suggestions from the participants, if you have any, just a few questions before we leave. Uh, uh, Professor Price, do you have any Suggestions uh, for the forthcoming. No, I just, no, I agree with everyone else. I thank you very much for organizing this, and I hope this will be the start of many such meetings in the future. We need to collaborate to to solve these problems. Thank you. Yeah. Professor Kim is there. I think he wants to ask something. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, namaste, all the professors and the students. Uh, I'm Kim Powell from Trivon University Institute of Engineering. Uh, also campus. Uh, in my opinion, the, this program is uh, really uh, excited and excellent. Uh, I congratulate to all the professors and all, uh, all the presenters for your great contribution. Uh, at the same time, uh, I humbly request uh, we, if we prepare the manual, manual from, um, from our side uh, to the school, colleges, and university or especially school and colleges, it will be, uh, I think, a milestone to spread uh, the information and knowledge in a short time. So if possible, uh, um, all of the experts and try to uh, think about this matter. And at the same time, uh, Professor uh, uh, Sriram Sarma, I myself, and another uh, electrical uh, engineer, Professor Navraj Karki, uh, also started the PhD student in our university, including the lab establishment. And such type of program will be uh, helpful in coming days. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor thank you. Kim, for your suggestion. And of course, yes, we are. Uh, in, in Nepal, we don't have any curriculum for the lightning, uh, particularly in school and uh, in technical level and anywhere. So thank you for your suggestion. We, we are trying to do uh, work on it and uh, getting something out of it. And I, I, I hope everybody in the uh, forum will uh, help us to bring up something. Thank you indeed, indeed uh, Professor Kim. Anybody else? Thank you, uh, Sriram Sar and all the professors and friends. Okay, then if uh, nothing comes up, uh, I would like to say goodbye. Yes, any, any? Okay, uh, goodbye and thank you everybody for being with us and uh, joining for, uh, with the information together to go uh, and work uh, in the future. Thank you indeed, uh, everybody and uh, take care. Goodbye, and we'll organize similar um, webinar soon, maybe after one month or something like that. But uh, I will let, let you know. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye -bye.